Catherine. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. I'm very uh, busy at the moment. I'm uploading some photos to the Facebook page. The question on everyone's lips this morning, I'm talking, speaking to you, is, well, I listened to the show yesterday, and I just spent the whole day anxious, wondering if Ian was able to get his car fixed. No, I wasn't able to get my car fixed. I fixed my car myself. I say I did it myself. My friend Paul was there with me, and he told me exactly what to do. But yeah, that's right. I managed to open the uh, bonnet, 15 minutes, locate the oil thing on the big metal thing, 10 minutes, uh, and then I poured some oil in. Turned the car on, and the little Aladdin's lamp had gone, so I had fixed it. I'm going to put those pictures up on the Facebook page. I thoroughly recommend that your life will not be complete without you seeing those images of me being a man. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. I'm also uploading uh, some pictures of some AstroTurf. I'll explain why later. But it, if you're a fan of Luton Town Football Club, it, it's important you go and look at those. OK, there's, there's a, a, an AstroTurf theme running through the show this morning, and it's very important that you are aware of it. Now, coming up in this hour, Barack Obama has been re-elected as President of the United States. You can give us your thoughts on that. What's the best way to sell a second-hand car? A Watford man has come up with a song and a video to try and sell it. How did you sell yours? Did you struggle? Was it tough? Hey, you know it's illegal to have a little sign in your car saying this car's for sale, give us a call 0764, whatever your number is. £400 ONO. It's illegal to put those signs up unless you have a licence. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? And mid-Bedfordshire MP Nadine Doris has been suspended from the Conservative Party for going to the jungle. Is that enough? Today I want to know from you, dear listener, should she be sacked? You can get in touch in lots of ways. I've mentioned the Facebook page, and I thoroughly recommend you go there. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. You can text 81333, starting your text 3CR. But the best way to get in touch about selling cars, about AstroTurf, and about Nadine Doris is on the telephone. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. She was all over the news yesterday, Doris, wasn't she? Should she be sacked? She's kind of made the position a laughing stock. People are laughing at you, mid-beds, because of her. Do let us know. Stevie Wonder. Well, not Stevie Wonder, I'm Stevie. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. And I'm sure there's lots of stuff this morning that you'll want to talk about. Now, Barack Obama has been re-elected as President of the United States of America. America's first black president has been returned to the White House in a close race with his Republican rival, Mitt Romney. You know, have you noticed how some newsreaders are saying Mick Romney? Yes, I won't, I won't name any, but mm, just keep listening to our news bulletins and see how close we get. <laughs> he clinched it for the Democrats after taking the battleground state of Ohio. There were jubilant scenes at the Obama headquarters, headquarters in Chicago as news came through that he was set to win. Zara Stone is a freelance journalist in New York. She joins us now. Good morning, Zara. Good morning. What's the atmosphere like over there? Uh, The atmosphere in New York is simply fantastic at the moment. People are celebrating in the streets. Times Square is absolute chaos. People are having parties. They're opening champagne. Everybody is just celebrating that they've got another four years of Obama. Uh, And at what point did the Obama supporters know that he'd won? Because it was so close for a while, wasn't it? It was very tense because everybody was riveted to the screen because we were being broadcast on a bunch of different networks. And people were just watching and there'd be cheers and then there'd be sighs. And this was just constant for about two hours. And then it just seemed to turn with Ohio. And this is where we really started to feel the passion rise in the audience. And it was almost this collective gasp as people kind of suddenly realised quite what was happening. And it was just really exciting to be around and just to see this kind of evolving before your very eyes. So there's the excitement of the Obama supporters. But of course, Mitt Romney's uh, people are going to be gutted, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, they're pretty devastated. You can see the coverage of them on television, and you have all the Obama supporters cheering and dancing, and Romney supporters look like they're just holding back tears, to be honest, because this is something they worked really hard for, and in some ways they had some good policies. They just didn't make it to the final line. Uh, Mitt Romney is... uh, Apparently he's uh, congratulating Obama on his victory now. What's the tone of uh, his speech like? I think he's been, you know, he's just trying to be friendly and trying to be polite. He's clearly very upset 
but he hasn't made it. He's going to be professional because he does have the best interests of America at heart. So they're going to try and have cordial relations with each other. That that must be hard, though, Zara, mustn't it? After you've, you've had such a, a, a tense, close-run race to then, you know, kind of be friendly about it. I'd be gutted. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think on the inside, he's probably kind of, you know, flashing. But outside, you know, he's a politician. He knows how to present himself to the world. What are uh, Obama's priorities going to be for the people of America now? I think looking forward, he's really going to be concentrating on foreign policy. We're going to be seeing a lot more of Obamacare coming up. And we're also going to be looking at, hopefully, a rise in education and trying to get the priorities of college students as well. Zara, are you up all night? or d- d- Will you be sort of I- indulging in the celebrations or are you off to bed now? What is it, two o'clock over there or something? It, it is two o'clock over there and I think I probably will be indulging in the celebrations. The atmosphere is so live and so vibrant that I think everyone's just going to be celebrating and just making sure they make the most of the evening. Zara, thank you very much. Zara Stone, freelance journalist out in New York City over in America. 08459 four double five five double five is the telephone. It was close... I did enjoy a lot of the, uh, the, the, the BBC's coverage of this sort of later last night. But they do, they do like doing a lot of filling, don't they? There was lots of, this morning as I was driving in at four o'clock, of Richard Bacon, who I think is excellent. I'm a big fan of Richard's. There was a lot of filling from Bacon, though. You'd never, you'd never hear such filling on this show. Right, let's have a look at the front pages, shall we? <laughs> do you see what I've done there? Um, let's have a quick look at some of the front pages we've got here. The Guardian, America's verdict on Obama. Exit polls, well, we know that this is one now. Uh, but more interestingly, a lot of the front pages are, are focusing on Nadine Dorries. She was everywhere yesterday, wasn't she? I'm a conservative and they got me out of there. The Conservative Party has suspended Nadine Dorries after it emerged she's to take time off from Parliament to be a contestant in ITV's jungle-based reality show. I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. We are asking this morning, she's been suspended from the Conservative Party. That kind of makes sense. Is that enough, though? Should she be sacked? Should she be sacked? Part of me kind of thinks that she should go and there should be a by-election, shouldn't there? If she feels happy enough to swan off for three and a half, four weeks to Australia to, you know, eat kangaroo scrotums and, and, and be paid £40,000 minimum, and she'll be, she'll be living in luxury, not in the, in the, the jungle, obviously, but they, they get flown out first class. Uh, they get put up in a six-star hotel. A six-star hotel. How is that even possible? Uh, the Independent, there's a picture of Obama. It's funny, isn't it, how quickly these front pages can be slightly out of date. Uh, because, you know, we know he's won. The Daily Express, crooked EU wastes £89 billion in one year. Uh, and then there's a picture of a lady. I've got no idea who she is. Joanne Frogat, oozing glamour at Fashion Awards. Not a clue who she is. Um, the Times, uh, we've done that. It's, uh, oh, no, we haven't. It's, it's another picture of Obama. The Daily Mail, women earn a half a million pounds less over a lifetime than men. Even for identical jobs, the pay gap is still huge. Uh, and the Dean, uh, Tory suspends and the Dean. And the Sun, the Sun have a pedo DJ bombshell. Wow. Uh, police quizzed Savile on Ripper murders. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. Don't forget, from nine o'clock every weekday morning, Jonathan Vernon Smith. Uh, always, uh, always an exciting listen. Uh, I don't always agree with what he has to say. If I'm honest, some of it's complete tosh. The Monday Show. Uh, his question on Monday: Are you an idiot if you let off fireworks in your back garden? No, you're not an idiot, Jonathan. You're just you're just a, a, a nice person enjoying a little bit of fun. That's all. But always a cracking listen. Wonderful show yesterday. Nine o'clock, the big question. Ten o'clock, he has a, a, an interesting guest, to say the least. And at eleven, it's my favourite bit. It's the consumer hour, uh, and it's it's a cracking listen, particularly if he's dealing with that car company that branded him a disgusting pervert. Imagine that. Morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number. If you want to give us a call about any of the things we're talking about this morning, including astroturf, stay tuned. Selling, I wouldn't mind your selling cars stories, please. They're, they're a nightmare to sell sometimes. Sometimes they go really quickly. Sometimes they're a nightmare. I remember uh, years ago, I had a really nice car, and I was trying to sell it in one of those magazines. You know the magazines, you, you, you advertise your car and stuff like that. And I just kept getting calls from like, agents and agencies who want to, yeah, we, we can sell your car for you. You're not going to go away. I'm trying to sell it myself. So if you've had trouble selling a car, or if you found it a piece of cake, Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. 
It's National Adoption Week. An adoption charity in Milton Keynes says siblings shouldn't be separated when being placed with new families. It comes after a government parliamentary debate in which the idea of separating brothers and sisters was discussed. If it speeds the adoption process... It was a debate that didn't set well, sit well with St Francis's Children's Society in Milton Keynes. They say it's crucial for a child's stability to keep siblings together. Our reporter, Sophie Solaria, has been to the St Francis Adoption Centre in Milton Keynes. She spoke to the chief executive of the society, Alison Miller. One of the ways that children find new families is through um, a newspaper called Be My Parent, and a lot of the children that are featured are sibling groups. I mean, you just look, open any particular page, and you've got three there, you know, a sibling group of three, two, two sibling groups of two. You know, there's a huge need for families to take on more than one child. Our view is, is that, that siblings should be kept together. Research has shown that it's a protective factor in terms of preventing placement breakdown. Um, and our experience as an agency that hasn't had an adoption breakdown since 2005 is that it is possible for adopters to adopt sibling groups and for those children to grow up together and have that sibling relationship lifelong. It's one of the most significant relationships that human beings have is with their brothers and sisters. So what's the effect that it could have on a child to separate them with? I think it adds ad- additional loss and grief. If a child has been uh, parenting a younger sibling, for example, it can create great anxiety and worry for that child about where that other child is, whether they're being looked after properly. Children often have very muddled memories about the time that they're at home um, because there's often been a lot of shouting, a lot of distress, and sometimes they need to check out whether those memories are real whether they're imagined, what the context of those memories are. And if they can do that with their brothers and sisters, that's a much healthier way of doing it. In certain situations, I can imagine that perhaps one sibling is a bit more unsettled than the other. Would that have a a detrimental effect on the other sibling? Yes, and I do think there are occasions where children need to be placed separately. Um, But I think what we're seeing is, is that those very large sibling groups of six, seven, eight children, it's still beneficial for the children to be placed with at least one sibling Um, and then we would get the adopters to keep in touch with each other as those children are growing up. And that's just as important, the keeping in touch. I think one of the key things, if you're going to take on, well, even adopting one child, is the support. Of course, a lot of these children that are that bit older may have experienced some pretty difficult times already by the age of five or six. What about the problems that the parent will take on as well? As an agency, we believe very much in staying with families for the long term. So we offer adoption support that's lifelong. And very often, if you've got a problem, um, they can come and talk to a social worker here. We can offer some advice, offer that kind of support to help sort that problem out early. What's your final message to people that are perhaps considering adoption but are just a little bit dubious? I think it's one of the most amazing things you can do because it's life-changing for a child. I have not ever met an adopter who said it hasn't been worth it. So our reporter, Sophie Solaria, speaking to Alison Miller, the CEO of St Francis Adoption Centre in Milton Keynes. One parent who chose to adopt siblings is Sue. We've changed her name to protect our identity. Sue and her husband decided to adopt after they found out they couldn't have children. She told BBC Three Counties that taking on two children as opposed to one meant they would have each other through the hard times. We were approved for one or two children, but we always went for a sibling group of two. Because it is a massive change for us as an adopter and also for the children that have been in care. It's nice that they have each other to play with, to experience new things. I mean, my two girls have experienced new things going to a beach they'd never been to a beach before they didn't know what sand was and they didn't know what the sea was i think of it as myself if i was adopted out from my other three siblings would i feel so alone yes i would so i wouldn't want to be morning in lee bbc three counties radio Lots that we need your input on. I guess the, 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 the main thing that you might be keen to discuss... Nadine Doris, again. <sighs> Everywhere yesterday. I felt a bit embarrassed yesterday. Five Live, Radio 4. Uh, 
ITV News at 10, LBC everywhere, everywhere was discussing the mid-beds MP, formerly of the Conservative Party. She's been suspended. Is that enough, in your opinion? Should she be sacked? <laughs> Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning! Lots on the show this morning. If you want to get involved at any point, the, the, the best way is to do I'm going to give you the Facebook page. So I've just put up some nice pictures of me fixing my car yesterday. Yeah. And putting oil in it does count as fixing it. So in your face. Uh, if you go to facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. There are pictures of me being a man and fixing a car. There are also uh, some pictures of uh, our reporter, Justin Dealey, holding some fake grass. Uh, go and have a look at it. Uh, we will explain all later. We need your help with a project that we're trying to get up and running for next Wednesday's show. Just, we need your help on it, OK? So go and have a look at the pictures and you might be able to get it from there. Coming up in the next half hour of the show... What's the best way to sell a second-hand car? I'm going to be meeting uh, a Watford man who's gone to extreme lengths to get 800 quid for his yellow Renault Clio. I suggest the colour of the car is perhaps the problem. How have you managed to sell your car? Been difficult? 08459 455 555. And a row is brewing over AstroTurf in Eton Bray. We've sent Justin Dealey off to keep the peace. We'll be hearing from him in the next half hour. You can text 81333. Starting your text, 3CR, uh, or you can give us a call. I'd much rather you phoned up. Isn't that more civil? 08459 455 555. My wife lost her mobile phone a couple of days ago. It's been quite peaceful, to be honest. I'm, I'm yay close to getting rid of mine. Uh, no, seriously, they, they're such a nuisance, aren't they? Always con- I'm always on it, and I don't need to be. If I didn't have my mobile phone, I'd read more, I'd do more, I'd talk to my kids... It's a tempting idea. So give us a call. Now, dear listener, you, I, I'm outside. And I tell you what, it's flipping cold, so this won't last long. <laughs> what am I doing out here? When you last tried to sell your car, you might have had to put it on eBay, advertised in your local news agents, or, or put it on a car website. Well, one Watford man is so desperate for his yellow Renault Clio to sell, he's written a song and made a video about it. Have a listen. So here's the question now. Well, that's a relief. The song is good. I was well, I hadn't heard it. I'd been told it was good. It could have been awful. Uh, I'm with Chris Ambrose. He's the owner of the car. We're outside in the Three Counties car park. Keep it brief, Chris, because it's, it's blooming cold. Uh, that's not a bad song. What, why did you write a song? Well, I thought, as you said earlier, like it's, it's illegal to put a sign in a window, and I couldn't think of another way of doing it, so I thought, better write a song, make a video. Not many people know that, but you, you're not allowed to put signs in the window, are you? Because it's you need a licence or something ridiculous. Yeah, that's a new one on me, actually. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, hey, listen, it's true. Um, or maybe it's not true. I might have just dreamt it. So you wrote a song. Uh, can I suggest your influences are perhaps McFly and Busted? <sighs> Oh. Yeah, that, that's. Uh, ah. yeah, I've been trying to escape that for many years, and it's nice of you to bring it up on radio. I'm a big fan of Busted. Let's all meet up in the year 3000. <laughs> Thank you, Work Experience Ollie, for mouthing the lyrics to me. That's a good song. It's, it's got that kind of feel to it. What, what influences would you like to cite? I, I just wanted a, a kind of cheerful guitar pop song because I think that's a spirit that's needed to, to influence people into possibly being interested in the car. What's wrong with the car? Listen, uh, the, the first thing is you're saying it's yellow. It's not yellow, that's gold. No, I, I'm suggesting it was gold, but uh, you know when you get those auto fill-in systems yeah. on when you're booking car parks, it always comes up as yellow, which slightly frustrates no, me. No, no, this is, this is definitely, dear listener, if you're interested in buying this car, it's definitely a gold car. Let's have, let's have a little look around it. I'm going to kick the tyres. Not sure why. That tyre's, you know, it's a, it's a tyre. It's one of my favourite tyres of the four, actually. Yeah, it's a good one. Why is it not selling? Come on, b- be honest. What's wrong with it? I, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I, I haven't been trying to sell it that long. I didn't go down the traditional routes, but I just thought, you know, so often you see a car advent, it's got no, it's got no heart, it's got no sense of where it's come from. So I thought maybe give it a bit of background, a bit of feeling, maybe people would be more interested. When this story was, was flagged up to me yesterday, I was a little bit worried that, it, that the song would sound awful. It would sound like someone had done it on a tape recorder in their bedroom. It, it, it's professional. It's good. What, are you a musician? Is this what you do? Um, I say I'm an enthusiast. I'm a hobby. I like to, <laughs> I like to mess around with, uh, with music, so it's nice to have a project that gave it more of a purpose. How long did it take you to do? 
I spent about uh, a week of evenings working on it after getting home from work and evenings and yeah, sitting with the guitar, strumming out a few things. Let's get let's get in the car. Let's get in the car and we'll have a little look. See what um, let's see what's inside. This is okay. Well, le hey, listen, man, it's nice and clean. You've you've done a cracking job here. No expense spared. I, I slaved over it, uh, polishing the paintwork and cleaning up inside. Okay, you'd let, just, just if anyone's interested, it has a compact disc player, no cassette player. I'd say that that's a, a negative that's going to go against you. It's very clean. Uh, it has um, a, a little pot tray there to put things in. It's got a lighter for smokers. Uh, yeah, but I, as far as I'm aware, no one has smoked in the car, so it's all very clean and fresh <laughs> in here. <laughs> you really are selling it! Uh, if people want to see your, your video and hear your song, where can they go? Uh, they can they can contact me on Twitter uh, at, at CP Ambrose or they can go onto Facebook and do you want to buy my car? I'll have a search on YouTube. You've set up a Facebook page to sell your car? Yeah, to give it a bit more detail because I realised I, I did the song and some of it was a bit tongue in cheek and I actually missed off some quite key details so I thought I'd better fill them in <laughs> online. <laughs> Chris, listen, uh, uh, how much are you asking for this? Uh, around £800, but I'm open to offers. Uh, oh, and a bit of an O&O going on yeah. there. Okay, Chris, listen, I wish you the very best of luck. Do let us know uh, if and when you sell it, and uh, let us know if you ha have a hit. And go on Top of the Pops, is that, is that still on a <laughs> Thursday or a Friday, Top of the Pops? I'm never sure. No, I, I think it's gone now, but uh, there's, there's a few equivalents around. The Pops is gone? <laughs> I know, it's devastating, isn't it? Oh, well, well, I sit and cry inside your Renault Clio. Let's, let's have a record, shall we? Thank you very much, Chris. I do like that song, Train and Ashley Munro, Bruises. Bit of country. I love a bit of country. We need to get a country act in one Friday morning. That'll be good. A little bit of fiddle, a little bit of banjo. Yeah, come on. I'm starting a country band. When I get round to it, but I'm going to. Me and my mate Scott. I say mate. He's just a bloke I met once. Right. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio, 6.45. Now, it's been all over the, the news yesterday. We talked about it, Jonathan talked about it. It was on all the BBC stations. Oh, it was on ITV News last... Everywhere. Mid-Bedfordshire MP Nadine Doris has been suspended by the Parliamentary Conservative Party over her decision to appear on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. She's in Australia ahead of her, her appearance on the reality TV show. The filming could take up to a month, meaning Ms Dorries would miss several key parliamentary votes. So, has she made the right decision? I'm asking this morning, do you think she should be sacked? 08459 455 555. Well, yesterday, before it had been confirmed that Dorries was to go into the jungle, our reporter Paul Scoynes spoke to Budge Wells, Deputy Chair of the Mid-Bedfordshire Conservative Association. He said... He had no idea she was planning to take part in the programme. If what we hear is true, we are very concerned um, as to what has happened, but we haven't been advised formally uh, by anybody in uh, our Member of Parliament's office as to what is going on. So, officially, we know nothing at the moment. I mean, on the basis that what we have read might be true, let's just do a bit of supposition here. If, if that is the case, where does that leave... Nadine Dorries within the within the realms of Parliament and also the, the, the association within Midbeds. Well, bearing in mind the precedent of George Galloway, um, who appeared apparently on this programme in the past, it does concern us that it does detract from the serious nature of our MP, who has voiced many serious issues in the House and elsewhere. And as such, we, uh, I, I personally, this is a personal view at the moment because I haven't discussed this with my chairman of the constituency, but I would think that it, it is not a helpful thing to be doing, um, especially when there's so much going on in Parliament at the moment that needs some serious thought. And have you, as an association, been in touch with Central Office about this already? Yes, I spoke to Central Office just now, and uh, they very kindly are taking away from us uh, all the press. We've had numerous uh, telephone calls from members of the press, and, of course, television has been around here this morning as well. And what are the options open to the association? I understand there's an emergency meeting that, that could be called tonight, and, and there'll be further discussions about that. Is there... I mean, what are the, the potential uh, outcomes of that meeting? Um, I can confirm that there is no such meeting being held. If it was going to be held, I'd be the one as a deputy chair political to call it. So I can confirm there is no emergency meeting. Uh, all that will happen is that now that uh, the press have more or less left the office area, uh, we will discuss the matter between the chairman and myself, and we will wait for formal confirmation that, that, uh, that Nadine is indeed in Australia. If that's the case, we will then have to consider what, if anything, we do about it. And I say that because we don't have any view as to what we do about it. Nadine uh, is, uh, has her own mind and she follows her own thoughts on these things. 
So we do want to be cautious before we say anything that could be detrimental. So you're suggesting then that the, there is no knowledge, she hasn't told anybody, no. if this is the case, that, that that's what she's doing? That's quite correct. We, we have not been formally told by her or her staff um, at Parliament uh, as to what she intends to do. Is that... Would you, would you expect your MP to tell you that if you, I mean, as, as the association? Yes, I most certainly would. Yes, and um, I do feel that we should have been told what was going to happen because um, Nadine is quite used to being in the press, as we all know, and she must know that what effect this will have uh, within the constituency, putting some of us, at any rate, who are responsible for the political running of the constituency, uh, at a disadvantage, as we don't actually know the facts. I think you got an email. Uh, that was uh, Paul Scoynes speaking to Deputy Chair of the Mid-Bedfordshire Conservative Association, um, Budge. That's a fantastic name, Budge Wells, isn't it? Now, it's interesting that he wasn't told that she was going. And I know for a fact that she would have signed a confidentiality contract basically saying, listen, you're going to be on this show, you are not allowed to, t- to tell anyone. You can maybe tell, you know, like your mum um, and your husband or your wife or whatever, but that's it. You can't tell you, you, anyone, really. That's incredible, though, don't you think, that she is, she's jetted off for a month. Her bosses didn't know, the party didn't know, no one knew. She's been suspended from the Conservative Party. Is that enough, in your opinion? 08459. If you live in mid-beds and she's your MP, particularly keen to talk to you, but I'm sure you've all got an opinion on this. It doesn't matter where you live. Should she be sacked? Should, there, should she stand down and should there be a by-election? 08459. 455. 555. Talking about AstroTurf today, a lot. Two different reasons. One good, one not so good, in, in some people's eyes. Let's go to the first one. A proposal to turn part of a village green in Bedfordshire into football pitches has been met by opposition. Eton Bray Lions, a junior football club, want to lease part of the green from the parish council for 21 years. They want to put down AstroTurf and develop two five-a-side pitches. Our AstroTurf correspondent, Justin Dealey, is in Eton Bray this morning. Morning, Justin. What's going on? Yes, I am indeed. Uh, Lots of people here live in Eton Bray at the radio car. I'm standing right next to the village green right now, Ian. Uh, Derek Copley is one of the people who doesn't want this to go ahead. Derek, for anybody who's never been to Eaton Bray before, just try and describe the village green. How big is this village green? Um, it's approximately uh, 200 metres by 100 metres, um, size of two football pitches. And the thought of any sort of astroturf, any sort of five-a-side pitch, makes you feel, what, quite sick? Uh, extremely, extremely. It represents about 25% of the area of the, uh, the green. Uh, it will change the whole nature of the green. It won't be the same. Okay, we'll come back to you very soon. Paul Marshall's here as well. Paul is the chairman of the Eton Bray Lions. Now, you have sides from, what, under fives up to under 18s. These five-a-side pitches, these astroturf pitches, why are they so important to you? Uh, It's the only way that we can continue as a football club for the children in the local community. Uh, During the winter, training becomes virtually impossible. Either we have to have 300 children that travel into Dunstable or to Leighton Buzzard, or we destroy the grass pitches that we're training on in a small pitch with some lighting. Now, of course, you do need planning permission for this. How confident are you that planning permission will be granted? Uh, I don't really know. We've uh, made a planning application in conjunction with the Parish Council. They've guided us through the process. Uh, We've tried to uh, apply uh, good reason to all of the problems that have been thrown up, and uh, we're confident that uh, we will get planning permission. You're surrounded by people this morning who are against this. I'm sure you feel quite nervous about doing this. But uh, these people are saying that you are going to destroy the village green here. What would you say to them? Well, I think it will change the village green. At the moment, we're standing next to a derelict pavilion and there's a a big field that isn't used very much. We want to have it used by 300 local children uh, for regular organised sport. OK, now, even if planning permission is granted you still need something like £250,000 because we're talking here about a 21-year lease. Children's football teams, how on earth can you afford a quarter of a million pounds? Uh, well, we are a big club. We have, as I said, even so, a quarter <coughs> of a million. Uh, the quarter of a million pounds is made up of uh, a number of items, including the VAT, uh, which can be recovered in some situations. Uh, we will get grant aid from the Football Foundation. Uh, we have the support of Bedfordshire Football Association for our club. Uh, we're a charter standard club, which means that we do things properly. We have uh, organised in a, 
away we have 40 qualified coaches so with 24 teams which we currently have this season it spreads the fundraising load quite widely okay lots of people to squeeze in here in a final word with glenn you've heard what paul's had to say there he's confident they will get the money this will be of benefit to local children be brutally honest what's your reaction to what you just heard well we're very disappointed um uh, our problem is that we think that the uh, the development is inappropriate. It's too big for this little park. Um, it will squeeze... Oh, come on, is it too big? I'm looking across here. I would say there's probably three football pitches. We're talking about two five-a-side pitches. Are you somebody who's lived here for a long time who doesn't like any sort of change? I don't mind change. I think uh, children, the future is with the children, and if they're going to play football, that's great. There's plenty of other football pitches... Um, around there's other places. Well, I oh, think I think the uh, up at School Lane there's a park, and uh, it would be more appropriate to be up there. And um, this is a this is a bit of green belt. It, it shouldn't be developed. It's the fencing, um, the lights. We're going to have. 20 foot high lights okay i've got about 30 seconds left paul i know you want to have a final word you're not happy these people who are standing in front of you right now have all come out early this morning to have their say all totally against you clearly they don't like you (laughs) are they just nimbus Uh, We believe so. I mean, this is the sort of thing that we were hopefully inspired by the Olympics, and we think that it's all good as a project. Okay. And a final word from you, sir? Um, Can you ask them why they posted on the website that um, they've already been... Planning permission has already been granted? Yeah, okay. Briefly? Uh, That was a mistake, and we were just um, optimistic. Right, guys, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for coming Not out for mistakes. us. I think that this row will be developing all morning. Justin, Clearly, lock, yourself, two sides. lock yourself in the car, Justin. It sounds like that last question was enough to tip it over the edge. Well, you can hear, you can hear them right now, still going on. In fact, should, should we let the microphone yeah, just, just go on, let's have a listen. there on your media website. What is it? Your planning permission that's been granted. You've obviously got an inside track to the uh, local authorities. Otherwise, how could you possibly do it? It hasn't been decided. So, of course, it's right. been decided because you published it. You said you're not a Tupley Hapney organisation. You're a big organisation. Why have you done that? If it's well, it not true, first. come on, answer. My main, co- my main concern. I live on the, in the village. My main concern is the parking. We live on a very, very, very dangerous corner. The st- there's four sides yeah, yeah. Okay. and every time I come out my life's in my hand and I'm used to the road and it's so you can't see up the road or down the road and that's my main concern a, as a, a mother it's a fair enough point Ian I think I'm going to hand you back to the studio now I know you've got more to come on this a bit later on this Thank morning you very much you Justin Daly we'll, we'll speak to Justin a bit later on we have got more in the show we'll be speaking to Ruth Archer from the Friends of the Green Committee and Councillor Gordon Johns from Eaton Bray Parish Council later on wasn't that fascinating wasn't that fascinating? I could have listened to that all morning. Justin, are you still there? Well, it doesn't really matter now. <laughs> oh, no, he's, he's, we, I think we may have lost Justin there. Look, that was like, that was like eavesdropping on a really big argument. We, we'll go back to them after the news. A little bit late for the news and the travel, but, but that was fascinating, wasn't it? Started off all nice and calm and polite, and it really kicked off. People love their village greens. We'll go back to Eaton Bray a bit later on. 08459 455 555. Forget the president. I'm keen to go back to Eaton Bray. Find out what's going on there. If you've just tuned in, you've missed a right ding dong. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you more in a bit. There is uh, the, the Eaton Bray uh, are in arms because um, the astroturf is being planned to be laid down on part of the village green. There was a cracking barney just before the news. We'll, we'll tell you more in the next half an hour. Do stay tuned. It's these kind of things that people, you know, on the outside, you think, oh, Village Green. It's, a, it's, it's small fish, come on. It's these kind of things that get people angry. We'll tell you more in a little bit. Coming up in the next hour of the show, Barack Obama has been re-elected as President of the United States. Mid-Bedfordshire MP Nadine Doris has been suspended for going to the jungle. Do you think that's good enough? Should she be sacked? Should she be made to stand down and have a by-election? And calling all owners... Of small pieces of astroturf. I, I need to hear from you this morning. We're, we're trying to. We have a strange request. Stay tuned, I'll tell you why in the next hour. BBC Three Counties Radio. If you want to get in touch this morning, I, I, I suggest you go to the Facebook page. We put up some nice pictures of me fixing a car and of the astroturf that um, we need you to locate for us. Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. 
Um, you can also text 81333, starting your text, 3CR, or you can give us a call. And that's the best way to do it. 08459 455 555. I'm sure you'll have an opinion. Whether you live in mid-beds or not, whether Nadine Doris is your MP or not, you'll have an opinion on whether she should stay or go. She's been suspended from the Conservative Party for going to the jungle without telling anybody. Nobody knew. You're not allowed to tell anybody. I think you can tell your employer, actually. I was offered it last year, and I turned it down. And I think I was allowed to... Well, I would have had to have told my employer. I couldn't have just disappeared for three and a half weeks. You have to tell them. Um, So you, you would have thought she would have told someone on the council or in the Conservative Party, wouldn't you? She's been suspended or or kicked out of the party for the moment. Is that enough? Would you want to see her sacked? 08459 455 555. Or maybe, maybe you agree with Lembitopic, huh? And you don't see what the fuss is about. You think it's outrageous that she's been made, to quote him, a pariah. That, you know, that she will be bringing politics to the masses. If you listened to um, Radio 4 yesterday, uh, Eddie Mayer on uh, um, the, 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 what the programme's called, PM, um, when he asked uh, the spokesman for Nadine Doris, how is she going to be able to talk about politics when she has a mouthful of kangaroo scrotum? What a fantastic question. 08459 455 555. Ophelia is in Luton. Good morning, Ophelia. Morning. What do you think you? about... I'm, I'm good, thank you. What do you think about Nadine Dorries? Um, I don't think that she should be sacked. I think that she should be disciplined because of the way she went about getting on the program, because she should have had a private discussion with um, the head of um, whoever was she was meant to have a discussion with in the Conservative Party. But she's not married to being an MP. Why can't she do something that's different? I understand that, you know, maybe it's a, an important time, but she'll be doing it for a charity. Well, but hang on. First of all, I don't think she is doing it for charity. We've had no statement on that. She'll be getting at least 40 grand in her back pocket. That's, that's the fee, plus she'll get loads of gigs on the back of it as well. So she'll make a fortune. And she's a serving MP, Ophelia. She's going to miss three, three or four weeks of her job of representing the people who put her there. That is important. Of course it's and important. I think, I think that um, the decision about whether she remains an MP should be made by her local constituents. I'm not into the Conservative Party, and her being a Conservative person is a crime in itself, so I shall be definitely voting to see her do some of them Bush Tucker child to have a good laugh. Well, see, that's maybe one way we can get back at her, is making her get covered in all the fish guts and snakes and have spiders yeah, crawling up her nose. Reacts. If that poshness is still there, she starts screaming. Ophelia, what's that noise in the background? Oh, you always get something from my call. That's just a kettle. I just turned it off now. Well, can, can I have a cuppa? It's the, sure noise, it's the noisiest kettle in the world. You sure can. I'm making um, Earl Grey this morning. I'll oh, give you some. I don't like Earl Grey. Oh, that's not out. Ophelia, that's not proper tea, love. <laughs> that's not proper tea. That's just, like so di- that's just like dirty water. <laughs> hey, I remember who you are. You're the lady, aren't you, that didn't have house insurance. Contents yeah, insurance. Say, uh, you know, can I just tell everybody, right? Please do, please do. That phone call that we had, yes. and when we discussed the seriousness of not having insurance, so had you was been, a good been, wake-up call. You've been burgled, and you didn't have contents insurance. Yeah, but right. after I spoke to you, the Saturday morning, I had organised my insurance, got my documents already sitting in there. Yeah. So I really appreciated that call. Sit on a serious note, I had to reflect and say, you know, it shouldn't have had to take my local radio station reminding me of the importance what did you just drop then? Oh, I'm washing out my flask. Don't wash... <laughs> please, for God's <laughs> sakes, woman. Oh, you could swing for you. Just put everything down, apart right, from the phone, and just talk down. to me. You know women always multitask. Don't, I don't know a woman that doesn't don't multitask. Don't boil what, what do you have in your flask? Earl Grey, is it? I'm going to put Earl Grey in oh, this morning. dirty, dirty. <laughs> so you've got, you've, got your, uh, you've got your contents insurance now. You're covered. Definitely. Fully covered, could and I'm s- going to make sure it never happens again. Ophelia, could you say... Listen, I'm, I'm new here. I, I need to get people on my side. Could you say, thanks to Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties, I've now got my home insurance? Serious. This is very serious, and it's true. Thanks to Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties, I've got my home insurance and didn't put myself in a legal wrangle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ophelia. Ta-ta. Thank you. Take care. See you Bye. later on. There you go. A lady using a flask. Who'd have thunk it? Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five. Uh Philip in London says, Good luck, Nadine. The whips are wrong. Bring on the bush tucker trials. So I'm confused. A lot of you, well Ophelia and, and, and Philip, kind of saying, Yeah, it's all right, she's in the jungle. It doesn't matter. She should be allowed to go in the jungle. 
shouldn't get the sack. But is it just because you're going to take a perverse pleasure in seeing her eating all kinds of horrible, horrible things? The thing is, it, her basic fee, we've been led to believe, is £40,000. I suspect it's a lot more than that. I suspect it's more than that. I don't know. Forty grand. But she'll make, if she does well, she'll make on the back of it 50 grand, 100 grand, with adverts, with TV appearances, with magazine columns. She'll probably get her own reality show off the back of it. You saw that, um, that woman who's uh, the Burko, Sally Burko. She's always off um, with living with gypsies, isn't she? Sally Burko and gypsies, I think. She, you know, she's got loads of spin-off shows. She's making a fortune. 08459 four double five five double five. Is it really appropriate? Should Nadine Doris be sacked? Now, Barack Obama has won four more years in the White House after one of the closest US presidential races in years. In the last few minutes, he thanked his supporters and promised change for the better in the future. In this election, you, the American people, reminded us that while our road has been hard, while our journey has been long, we have picked ourselves up. We have fought our way back. And we know in our hearts that for the United States of America, the best is yet to come. The Republican candidate, Mitt Romney, has conceded defeat and thanked his supporters gathered at his election HQ and have words of support for President Obama. I have just called President Obama to congratulate him on his victory. His supporters and his campaign also deserve congratulations. I wish all of them well, but particularly the president, the first lady, and their daughters. This is a time of great challenges for America, and I pray that the president will be successful in guiding our nation. Uh, at the latest count, Barack Obama is project- oh, no, uh, he's projected sorry, to have 303 of the Electoral College votes. He needs 270 to retain the White House for the Democrats. Our reporter, Simon Thompson, has been following all of the action. Simon, what's the reaction been to Obama win- winning? Well, uh, messages coming in all the time, but interesting uh, that uh, the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, took to uh, Twitter, a oh. recent convert to the internet, to tweet uh, many warm congratulations to my friend at Barack Obama. Look forward to continuing to work together. The EU have also uh, sent congratulations to President Obama. Looking forward to working with a key economic partner. Uh, messages now coming in all the time, but of course for a long time during the night, it didn't look like we would be sitting here at what could have passed, uh, just before could have passed uh, seven this morning, uh, already having heard uh, Mitt Romney concede defeat and President Obama uh, with his, congrat- with his uh, uh, victory speech. Why? Because for a long time during the night it looked at that the election was too close to call and it still is in terms of the popular vote, that very very close in terms of the share of the vote, 49.3% to 49.1% but it's the electoral college system that won it for President Obama. Uh, uh, he, he was able to win in the key marginal states uh, where the, a lot of money was spent by both candidates, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Minnesota uh, and Ohio, the key state that actually made western state that actually won it and took him over the 270 electoral college mark simon what does it mean for us in the uk apart from cameron being an idiot and tweeting something <laughs> well, I mean, uh, so much for America. I mean, America, despite uh, the, the rise of China, uh, is still the uh, n- world's uh, number one economy or thereabouts and, and, and has so much influence in the world in terms of foreign policy, in terms of uh, uh, the economy. And, of course, let's not forget, it was, uh, uh, many would suggest that uh, the, the, uh, the world's uh, recession that, that hit uh, the UK a few years ago and we're still recovering from uh, was very much started in America with bad loans, uh, mortgage loans and deals. And, and so, of course, what happens in America tends to happen in the UK economy as well and so that is why america is, is extremely important and of course being such a big country anything it does in terms of uh, policy in terms of uh, uh, in the environment is an important factor too in trying to cap- uh, uh, combat gl- uh, climate climate uh, 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 change global warming uh, a key issue which wasn't really talked about so much in this campaign but of course people saw what happened with Storm Sandy on the East Coast, uh, and, and of course people still suffering the artefacts of that. People in New York, for instance, and all along the East Coast were struggling to even get to polling stations uh, uh, because of the problems and uh, the aftermath, the debris that's piled up in the streets. So, so certainly a lot of issues that President Obama will need to address, but he did make a point of saying at one stage, look, it's been a hard road, a difficult comeback, but in our hearts we know, as American people, the best is yet to come. Simon Thompson, thank you very much. I can't believe David Cameron tweeted here. Is that, is that really what we've sunk to? The Prime Minister sending his congratulations to the President of the United States via 140 characters or less? 
Hashtag congrats Obama. That's got me quite angry. What a plum! Uh, I've just been told that... Um, Our view is oh, that... Excuse me, there we go. I'm sorry, I've just been told that Obama announced uh, his, he'd won the election on Twitter. What is the world coming to? I want It makes me want to eat my own fingers. This is outrageous. I'm angry now. I was having a good morning. I'm furious. Right. If siblings are separated when they're adopted, it's a bad idea. That's according to St Francis, an adoption charity in Milton Keynes. This week is National Adoption Week. The charity says it's crucial for a child's st- stability to keep brothers and sisters together. Our reporter, Sophie Solaria, spoke to Alison Min- Miller, CEO of St Francis Adoption Centre in Milton Keynes. She says a sibling relationship is one of the most significant a person can have. Our view is, is that, that siblings should be kept together. Research has shown that it's a protective factor in terms of preventing placement breakdown. Um, and our experience as an agency that hasn't had an adoption breakdown since 2005 is that it is possible for adopters to adopt sibling groups and for those children to grow up together and have that sibling relationship lifelong. It's one of the most significant relationships that human beings have is with their brothers and sisters. So what's the effect? Effect that it could have on a child to separate them with their sibling. I think it adds ad- additional loss and grief. If a child has been uh, parenting a younger sibling, for example, it can create great anxiety and worry for that child about where that other child is, whether they're being looked after properly. Children often have very muddled memories about the time that they're at home. Um, because there's often been a lot of shouting, a lot of distress, and sometimes they need to check out whether those memories are real, what the context of those memories are, and if they can do that with their brothers and sisters, that's a much healthier way of doing it. Well, Louise Hocking is the Director of Child Placement at the British Association of Adoption and Fostering. She joins me now. Good morning, Louise. Good morning. Louise, do you agree with St Francis? Is it essential to keep siblings together no matter what? Well, it's very much um, judged on a case-by-case basis. Um, I absolutely agree with Alison that you would start from the uh, premise that you would want to keep siblings together. Um, As she said, the the relationship that you have with your brothers and sisters is the most long-lasting relationship that you'll have in your life. Um, If you think of your natural lifespan and at the point you might lose your parent or meet your partner, actually your sibling relationship is the one that endures, you know, for your whole life. Um, But you would need to consider whether siblings' needs were compatible. Uh, So whereas you would start from wanting to keep a sibling group together, it might be that they would have had some experiences and as a result have such significant needs that you would need to consider can one adoptive home, for example, meet all the needs of each of those children individually. So it's something about starting from the point of trying to keep siblings together, but then having a really thorough assessment as to whether that was realistically possible. What effect would it have if, if, say, the brother gets adopted and the sister doesn't? That would be devastating, wouldn't it, on the one that gets left behind? It it would, and and it very much depends on having appropriate plans for all of the children. For example, if they were uh, siblings that were younger children and an assessment showed that maybe they'd be better placed separately, what you would try and do is find an adoptive home, so a similar type home for each of them, and then you'd have a really good contact plan so that those two children still had contact and knew each other and had a relationship with each other as they grew up, even if they were living uh, with separate families, so that that relationship still, still lasted, but maybe their needs were being met separately. It must be tough for new parents to uh, uh, take on more than one child, especially a child that may have emotional issues. It, it really is. Um, I mean, this week is the 15th anniversary of National Adoption Week, and uh, we're highlighting that particular groups of children wait longer for adoptive homes and and one of those groups of children is sibling groups Um, and it's it's quite a tough uh, call for somebody to come forward to adopt a sibling group Um, they're not only managing the range of issues that adoption brings into their life uh, and the child's but they're also managing the dynamics between the children Um, But what a good adoption agency would do is they would help support
support, educate, inform, encourage and be there to ensure that that adoptive home was able to meet those siblings' needs. So you would really try and find uh, an adoptive placement that with good support could care for those children for the rest of their lives. How many kids are there waiting to be adopted? There are approximately 4,000 wow. at the moment, uh, so a significant number. Um, and certainly on our adoption register last year, nearly half of those children were in sibling groups. Uh, so there's a significant number waiting, and there's a significant number of sibling groups. Um, and I suppose just to go back to Alison's point, what we would strive to do is to keep siblings together wherever possible. Louise Hocking, Director of Child Placement, British Association of Adoption and Fostering. Thank you very much. Uh, let's hear now about the psychological effects that separating siblings can have. Jessica Valentine is a child psychologist from St Albans. Good morning, Jessica. Good morning. Is keep it, it, it seems obvious to me, although I could be completely wrong, that keeping siblings together is beneficial and is, is more helpful than separating them. Is that right? Um, I do agree. I agree with what everyone is saying this morning. Um, to an extent, but I, I would strongly encourage that siblings stay together. However, it, it, you know, you don't know really what goes on at home to, you know, get them on the adoption list in the first place, so that obviously needs to take precedent. I would imagine that, it, that, that obviously, everyone's different, that, that, that one child in, in the sibling relationship might be uh, more uh, emotionally damaged than the other and could be harder work. Uh, it, it's understandable then, isn't it, to, why some people would only want to take one of the children? Um, yeah, I think adopting a child, it, you know, you need to go in uh, realizing that it's not going to be easy. It's not easy um, raising, re you know. Kids are hard work, aren't they? Yeah, well, definitely. Man alive. <laughs> um, definitely. But, um, but I think with the adoption, you know, they already have that sort of degree of um, attachment issues. So they're going to be a bit more challenging mm. um, trying to connect with them and trying to understand you know, where they're coming from, why they may have done something um, inappropriately. Um, you have to really sort of get down on their level and, uh, you know, use empathy. Put your feet in their shoes. What would it be like if you were taken away from your family and, and w w taken away from your siblings? The only thing mm. that, you, that you know, that you love, that, that you have this instant sort of connection. I would imagine that being separated from your sibling could uh, result in uh, quite a bit of resentment, perhaps. Um... Yeah, I think probably separating from your parents could create it, yeah. an anger, but with siblings, I would say more, yeah, maybe more, more of a sadness or a loss. Uh, and, uh, is there a possibility of, of behavioural problems if, if siblings are split up? Um, sure, definitely. I mean, I, but to be quite honest, the, the behavioural problems more than likely would start from either at birth, and you know, or the degree of being taken away from the parents. Right. I think it would encourage better behavior if they were dealt with together. But then again, parents, you know, think of, a, think of an issue magnified. That's mm. probably what it would be like to have siblings, you know, both sort of the same issues. Maybe one has a learning disorder. One, um, you know, I, I know someone that has adopted a, a brother and a sister, lovely little children in Hertfordshire, actually, both white families. And um, the, the uh, I think she's five now, she's so intelligent, so loving and caring towards her little brother, who I think has some learning disorder, learning difficulties, um, but lovely children doing really well, thriving, and mm. I think that's the key word here. Where can you place these children where they can thrive the best? That's the most important thing. Jessica Valentine, child psychologist from St Albans, thank you very much. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Some of your texts on Nadine Doris. Should you be sacked? 81333, start your text 3CR. Pat says, Ian, of course it's OK for Nadine Doris to jet off to earn money at our expense. After all, we pay her wages, and that is what wealthy people do. That's the second time that, 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 that sort of uh, class... And um, financial status has been brought up. That's interesting, isn't it? They are afforded rights the rest of us are not. We are all in this together. I don't think so. One MP has gone AWOL, some are in prison, and the rest of them are making a mess of ruining our country. Dave says, I think she should be sacked. It doesn't really matter whether she's an MP or not. If I went away without telling my employer, I would have a job to come back to. And I'm sure most other people... I wouldn't have a job to come back to, sorry. And I'm sure most other people wouldn't either. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You leave your boss in the lurch, you're going to, for a month, you're probably going to get the boot. 
uh, frequent flyer has texted, far from suspending Nadine Doris, I think this could be the start of a new era of electoral reform. I'm not sure I could vote for someone now unless I'd see them eating a kangaroo's bottom while balancing a scorpion on their head. Bring it on. There's an image for you. Hope you're enjoying your breakfast, kids. The Dean should be sacked, says an anonymous texter. We would have been sacked for being absent without permission, but it's one rule for them, another for us. 08459 455 555 is the phone number if you want to give us a call on that. And also, have you got a bit of AstroTurf? Keep listening. I'll explain why that's important in a second. It is very important. We posted on the uh, facebook.com forward slash BBC3CR. The question, should Midbeds MP Nadine Dorries be sacked? Simon Kindler has replied, yes. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning. 7.32. It's Wednesday the 7th of November. It's blooming cold out there, isn't it? It's not nice at all. Don't worry. Uh, lots coming up in the next half hour of the show, including it's all kicking off in Eton Bray. It's because of a row over a football pitch. And what does the future hold for Mid-Beds MP Nadine Doris? We'll be finding out from Deputy Chair of Mid-Beds Conservative Association, Budge Wells. We're asking this morning, do you think that her suspension is enough? Should she be sacked? 08459 455 555. There seems to be very little sympathy uh, for her. She's, she's nicked off for three and a half weeks, four weeks. Probably still going to get paid. It does seem a bit ridiculous, doesn't it? 08459 455 555. On FM, AM and online. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, a proposal to turn part of a village green in Bedfordshire into football pitches has been met by opposition. Eton Bray Lions, a junior football club, wants to lease part of the green from the parish council for 21 years. They want to put down AstroTurf and develop two five-a-side pitches. Well, our reporter, Justin Dealey, has been getting local reaction in Eton Bray this morning. Tell us why you're so against it. Uh, the traffic. When, when, uh, when, there's a, when there's a match on here... And there's a Methodist church just up the road with more cars. This junction is dangerous. That's my main objection. I went to insure my house for a quote, floodplain. They wouldn't insure me, and they're going to build this monstrosity. I know the drainage is going to be very good, but it's not as good as that grass field. And it's agreed. I live in the Rye, and when you come up the Rye and there's a football match on, you can't get past the cars. If a car comes the other way, two, three cars cannot pass down the Rye. It's very dangerous, and they use it as a rat run to Leighton Buzzard. The same thing, really, is main. My main thing is the parking. I've seen near accidents on a Sunday, and that's what worries me, but it's going to be every day. Well, there you go. People are very passionate uh, about this. Well, Ruth Archer joins me now. She's from the Friends of the Green Committee, formed by a group of local residents who oppose the plans. She joins me now. Morning, Ruth. Good morning. Uh, why aren't you against these plans? I'm against these plans because I feel that this is a village green mm-hmm. and that when we first heard about this... It was in February 2012 in the Focus magazine. Mm. And initially, it was said that Eton Bray Parish Council, ha- pa- Parish Council had been approached about the possibility of enclosing a small part of the Rye Recreation Ground. Mm. They omitted to say that it was going to be enclosed by 4.5 metre high fencing around six goal ends and have six eight metre high galvanised floodlights and it would be in operation from half past nine in the morning till ten o'clock at night seven days a week they also omitted to say that there was going to be a lease given to Eton Bray Lions the terms of the lease we still do not know Effectively, I feel that Eton Bray Parish Council have been less than transparent, given that they were the applicants mm. for this proposal, and the applicants then gave the actual um, so-called public consultation. So surely there's a, a conflict of interest there. You are prepared to take the Parish Council to court? I am. On this. On what grounds? 
on the grounds that this is a village green. This is a village green that should be enjoyed for everybody, not for a small percentage of people. I have absolutely no objections to kids playing football on the on the green, to uh, adult teams playing on the green. That's always been the nature of the green. That's why it's been called the recreation green. I do object to a small minority being given the green. Um, effectively, that means that the... Uh, Villagers will be restricted. Okay, Ruth, stay there. Ruth, on, on, on the phone now, we've got Councillor Gordon Johns from Eatonbury Parish Council. Good morning, Councillor. Good morning. A lot of the residents don't support these plans. Why are you supporting the proposal? Well, as Ruth has said, uh, we were approached by EB Lions uh, at the end of last year and we considered their proposals. We <clears throat> um, publicised the proposals on our website in January. Uh, we publicised them further in the local magazine, which Ruth has mentioned, in February. We asked for responses, um, and that consultation period was open for a month. We got those responses and published them in our minutes. They were overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and, <clears throat> of course, when the planning application was made, the Paris Council having decided that, in principle, we supported the idea... Um, the the uh, planning authority, Central Bedfordshire Council, also went out to consultation. Uh, they consulted 167 local residents. Um, they got 133 responses. Again, overwhelmingly positive. What was the percentage of those that were positive? 98 out of 133. Okay. Can I just say that when I looked on the website, 70 of those, res- of those responses were from outside the village in places as far as Luton, Sharpenhoe and Leighton Buzzard. That uh, may well be the case, but those were the people that Central Bedfordshire consulted. Why would if the councillor, surely, our, councillor, sorry, surely yeah. it would make sense to ask the people that are immediately affected by it, as opposed to people out of the uh, area, wouldn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, and that's what we did in our consultation, and all but three of our responses were from postcodes within the village, and they were over, overwhelmingly positive. Can I, can I say... Hey, listen, can, councillor, can, councillor, let Ruth speak. Let can speak. I say, one of the reasons why it was overwhelmingly um, positive is because you did not... Um, give all the facts to the villagers. You only presented four positive reasons. You did not say about the enclosed, the 4.5 metre enclosure. You did not say about that you were going to lease the green to the um, uh, EB Lions. You did not say that it was going to be... um, Floodlit. So, and Councillor, you d- you've not mentioned the, the. Apparently, you didn't mention the lease, the floodlights, and the the high walling. Well, we did. The, first of all, they're not walls; they're transparent. Okay, fences. they're high transparent Secondly, fences. They're still unattractive, though, aren't they? Second, but you didn't mention those. Secondly, we didn't mention them in our consultation because at that point we didn't have that detail. All of that so was that in be, detail. How? Ruth, please let me finish. All of that was in detail in the planning application which was made to Central Bedford. But, but Councillor, if, if, if you're saying that the feedback on your initial consultation that didn't mention the floodlights, that didn't mention the fencing was positive, yeah. do you not think it's fair to have another consultation where you do mention those things? Because if fencing, if it's four and a half metres high, it's quite unattractive on a village green, isn't it? Well, it's al- with respect, it's already been done. I'm repeating myself. Central Bedford Council is the planning authority. Well, do you not think not it was... Us, but, but they have asked... Speak, no, please. I won't, Councillor, because they, you, they've, asked people, they've asked people outside of the village. They've you asked, asked mostly people within the village. Right. And the response has been positive. Do you not think you're misleading? The detail was in the planning application. Do we you, are not the planning authority. Do you not Central think, Bedfordshire are. Do you not think you are misleading by um, asking people inside the village and not giving them the full facts? No. But can you not see that this is clearly flawed? And I have taken legal advice, and he does believe that this will be open to, to judicial review if it goes to court. And as for the fact that you, the Eton EB Lions approached the parish council, I would like to know why, in August 2011, I have a letter here which says um, uh, Councillor Piggott actually approached um, DEFRA and Richard Bennion, MP for DEFRA, about Eton Bray Parish Council's wish to build an all-weather football pitch. So I don't think it's clear who's approached who. To me, it just seems that you want to get rid of this green. Councillor? Well, first of all, the green is one of two in the village of which it is the smaller, 
This proposed uh, all-weather training pitch, by the way, it's not a five-a-side pitch, would it's take going to be two five-a-side pitches. Would take up approximately 10% of the area of the green. That's the first point. Secondly, as far as the law is concerned, I'm not a lawyer, but I can only quote really? you from what um, the National Association of Local Councils' advice is about the use of village greens. Um, an encroachment or erection is on a green is illegal unless carried out with a view to the better enjoyment of the green. Now, greens are specifically intended by legislation for the sports and pastimes of those using Okay, Cass, let me try. Ruth, Ruth, it's going to take up 10% of the green. You can use the other 90%, can't you? Well, firstly, we don't know if we can use the rest of the green because we do not know the terms Let's of the ask, lease. Can they use the rest of the green, Councillor? Absolutely. There you go. And also, what I would also like to say, going back to the fact that you were saying it's not two five-a-side football pitches, but actually two, the five-a-side pitches are is a growing business and if you actually look very carefully at eb lines astro project it's quite clear that this is going to be a commercial enterprise and furthermore i would like to know why eb lions printed on their website that they had received um planning permission that they announced that they were delighted EB Lions AFC is delighted to announce that we have secured formal planning permission for our new all-weather floodlit training pitch at the Rye, Eaton Bray. A very big thank you to everyone who submitted letters and emails of support. Now, to me, it seems to me like EB Lions has inside knowledge. Perhaps you could also answer why Neil Rigby, the football coach, told Mr Howard that it was a done deal. Let's... Let, let's we, the, we're talking about people that I don't know their names of, but, but, but we had this raised earlier on, Councillor, that it had been announced on their website that the uh, planning permission had been granted. Well, uh, as Ruth per- perfectly well knows, because she was at the Parish Council meeting this week, okay, tell me. that came as a surprise to everybody, including me, and the representatives of BB Lions who were there said, absolutely right, that's a mistake, and we have taken it down, or are about to take so it you down. Can, you, can guarantee, you can guarantee that there is nothing uh, um, shadowy going on absolutely here. Absolutely not. How okay. can there be? It was posted on the 24th, it was posted on the 24th of October, and it was also posted on the forum. Are you you saying that you don't look at the forum, that you had absolutely no idea? I'm not saying I don't look at the forum, I'm saying I had not seen that, and as you've already been told, it was an error. It was a mistake. Okay, very quickly, final question for you, Councillor. Uh, the, The grounds leased for 21 years... No, we haven't. We haven't decided on okay. any of the terms of the lease. Yet. Okay, well, the, the, probably the, longer, I would suspect. Wow. Okay, so let's let's be generous and say twenty-one years. Mm-hmm. How much money is the the, the, the council going to parish council going to make from that? Uh, again, we don't know. I can only tell you that, as an example, the lease which we have with the cricket club on another piece of land which the parish council owns is for one hundred pounds a year. I would expect that to be a similar figure. You ex- you're saying here, councillor, that you're expecting to get one hundred pounds a year for the uh, the lease of the these pitches i i don't know what the parish council will decide but that would be typical yes okay. we're not this is not a money making oh, okay. proposition for either us or eb lion ruth final word to you right what well, i'd like to say Very quickly if you don't mind this is not a small organization this is a massive organization with professional people behind it they have a hundred thousand pounds awarded to them from the football foundation and sport to england so this is not a mistake i am suggesting that they're has been collusion. I am asking for the ombudsman to be brought in. Okay, and I'm w- very careful about any accusations that we kind of throw around here. Ruth, well, uh, I'm going to have to end it there because we're out of time. Ruth Archer from the Friends of the Green Committee, thank you very much. Councillor Gordon Jones from Eaton Bray Parish Council, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. We, we, we've talked about the bad sides of AstroTurf, the controversial sides. Can I just very briefly talk about the positive sides of AstroTurf? Uh, Justin Dealey, who is our AstroTurf correspondent here at BBC Three Counties Radio, surprised us all yesterday in the office by shouting out loud, apropos nothing whatsoever, that he owned a part of Luton Town Football Club's artificial pitch. We laughed, we mocked, we threw staplers at him, as we often do. He got quite upset. He brought it in this morning. He paid a tenner for it. It's tiny. He paid a tenner, and I thought he'd come in with, like, quite a big chunk of AstroTurf. He didn't. He came in with this tiny, tiny little piece 
of AstroTurf. If you want to see what it is, go to uh, facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. There are a couple of pictures. There's one picture of uh, Justin holding it, looking very proud. Aidan has uh, posted by the picture, great photograph. Notice that all the 3CR presenters are good looking. Is it in the contract? <laughs> You've not seen JVS, have you? Anyway, back to this AstroTurf. There's another picture with the stats on it, and it's Luton Town FC, artificial pitch, 1985 to 1991, has all the stats, the matches, the wins, the draws, the losses. And we kind of thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could get as much of this AstroTurf back together? I've got some... Oh, here it is. I thought I'd lost it then for a second. I'd have been in terrible trouble. Here it is. That's what it sounds like. Did you buy a piece of Luton Town's artificial pitch for a tenner? Were you a sucker? I mean, were you one of the lucky ones who got your hand on this piece of history? If so, could you get in touch with us? Now, I, <laughs> I've got no idea if we're going to get any calls or any texts or emails on this at all. Dealey yesterday was, oh, yeah, you'll get loads. Oh, yeah, yeah, you'll get loads of people doing it. Oh, no, seriously. Seriously, you will get loads of people getting in touch with this. So, let's see. Because next Wednesday... In the BBC Three Counties car park, we are going to put together as many pieces of this AstroTurf as we can and get one of the legends of Luton Town FC to kick a football on it or something. So we meet, need more than dealies, otherwise it's, it's going to be standing on tippy-toe. If you've got some, email me, 3cr at bbc.co.uk, put in your heading Ian Lee AstroTurf, or give us a call now. In fact, maybe you should give us a call now just to make us let us know we're not on a hiding to nothing. 08459 455 555. If you've got any of Luton Town's AstroTurf, can you give us a call? Because Dealey, oh yeah, no, we'll get loads of people. Oh, no, 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 all right, girl, we'll get loads, all right, girl, we'll get loads of people. That was him yesterday. I'm not so sure. 08459 455 555. Have you got any of Luton Town's AstroTurf? Now, the decision by Mid-Beds MP Nadine Doris to take part in I'm a Celebrity has led to her suspension from the Conservative Party. She's in Australia ahead of her appearance on the reality TV show. The filming could take up to a month, meaning Ms Doris would miss several key parliamentary votes. BBC Three Counties political reporter Paul Scoynes joins me now. Good morning, Paul. Morning, Ian. How big a blow is this for the Conservative Party? Well, it's, I, 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 speaking to sources yesterday, they seem to suggest that this was another sort of Nadine moment where they roll their eyes, look to the skies and wonder what's going to happen next. I mean, I, I got the feeling among the uh, people in the constituency yesterday, they were very disappointed by being let down. Uh, they, they felt that they should have been told about what she was going to do. I think the chief whip, George Young, probably feels he should have been told about it as well because that came as a bit of a surprise to him as well. So, you know, for the Conservative Party, there were calls yesterday that David Cameron was looking weak. He hadn't already taken decisive action then. At around six o'clock yesterday, as you say, uh, she was suspended from the Parliamentary Party, which means that she's uh, not in the House. She is technically, you know, an independent within the uh, uh, within the House of Commons. It only just remains now to see whether or not the uh, the local party will deselect her, which would then effectively end her career as a Conservative MP. Would that suspension be lifted if she became Queen of the Jungle? <laughs> who knows? Uh, well, this is one an interesting one because Anne Widdicombe, who uh, who of course appeared on Strictly Come Dancing, this was after she was a, uh, an MP, of course. Yeah. Um, she said that the, uh, the, the the this decision to suspend her was an overreaction. They said that uh, uh, it was because you know people in the Conservative Party didn't understand po- public opinion. Uh, if she did win, who knows? I mean, in whether or not they would in- invite her back into the party, I don't know. Uh, some might see this as a good opportunity to get rid of somebody who's caused the. Mm. the rather a few problems in her time anyway but uh, it, it, the door is you know not closed on her uh, you know if she when when she does come back um, the the chief whip will have a, a i can only imagine a very difficult conversation with her uh, and will make a decision on whether or not he he restores the whip if you like paul stay there we've got budge wells the deputy chair of the mid beds conservative association Ooh. on the line good morning budge good morning Jerry. a bit embarrassing isn't it Yes, in a word, it is. Um, we were not made aware, uh, any of us at the constituency office, of what was going on. And um, yesterday morning, we started fielding phone calls and camera crews at our Shefford office, and we seemed to go on doing that till middle afternoon. Um, clearly, the press were interested. We rather hoped they wouldn't be. Um, and there we are. She's in Australia. Um, she's a free person. She can make her own mind up what she wants to do. But, um, yes, it's left a few problems for us. Should she be sacked? 
Uh, no, I think that's a bit strong. Um, I think what we need to do is when she comes back, we need to have a meeting with her and discuss uh, the whole executive of the Midbeds Conservative Association needs to meet with her and discuss, hear what she has to say first, uh, and then discuss the matter and then come to a conclusion. But it would be wrong for me to uh, give any credence to that sort of issue. She is saying uh, that, uh, that this will bring politics to a bigger audience, um, that it will make politics hip and cool. I'm slightly paraphrasing there. Yeah. Can you really do that in a, in a jungle when you're being covered in spiders and eating kangaroos' bottoms? In my opinion, and this is a personal opinion, it's not the opinion of the executive, but in my opinion, when you look at an MP talking about something serious, you like to think you're looking at somebody who is serious. To look at somebody who's taken part in that sort of uh, television uh, entertainment makes it a bit more difficult to take someone, you know, that seriously. Will she still be getting her MP's wage? I imagine so. Oh. I can't comment on that, but I, as far as I understand, uh, Sir George Younger has suspended her whip, so she's not a Conservative, but she is still an MP. So I imagine from that point of view, yes, she'll continue to receive her salary as an MP. There are some people calling for a by-election to give the people of Midbeds the opportunity to decide if they want to. Would that, is that feasible? No. Uh, you know, I, I, this could get easily out of hand. I think what we need to do is... What I, I think, think it is out of hand, Budge. It was all over the news yesterday. It was on, it was on all the, the radio well, stations, the TV. I mean, from the point of view of our executive, where, I mean, it's not just the executive, it's the paid-up Conservative members of Midbeds who decide whether or not they want her as their MP. And that isn't something that we've got anywhere near looking at yet. Um, I've called a meeting of our executive for some time this week when we can get together and discuss it, but we're a long way from that sort of thing. What, we, what will happen in that meeting? Can you talk us through it? Well, um, the chairman, will, Paul Duckett, who was on radio and TV with me yesterday, he will chair the meeting and the only item on the agenda will be uh, our MP. Right. And a view will be taken, we'll discuss it and see whether we think it's a good thing or not a good thing that she's done this, and uh, take a balanced view. And then, it, should we decide to take it further, then we'll have to consult the, the members of the Conservative Party in uh, mid Bedfordshire. When is that uh, meeting, Budge? Uh, I don't know. I've got my secretary at Shefford. I'm going in there this morning at half past nine. She didn't know anything about it till about nine o'clock last night, so she will be calling that okay. meeting as soon as we can get together, hopefully this week. We shall follow that up. And finally, what would you say to the people of Midbeds who are left without an MP for four weeks? Well, you've still got... Um, a lot of c conservative councillors running Central Beds Council who are de dealing with the day-to-day -day issues that face um, all the residents of Central Bedfordshire, not just the conservative ones, and we're doing a good job to put conservative views and conservative policies forwards uh, to give value for money to the residents of Central Beds. Are you going to be watching? Um, I, I doubt it. It's... It's just not my sort of programme. <laughs> well, wouldn't you get a perverse pleasure in seeing Nadine covered in fish guts? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I would be highly embarrassed if I saw that. Budge, thank you very much. Budge Wells, the Deputy Chair of the Midbeds Conservative Association. Paul Scoynes, you still there? Yes, I am. <laughs> 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 yes, just... <laughs> well, well I, I mean, well, an interesting thing. I mean, it, you know, this is fascinating because... Look at him trying to recover. I love it. This is this great. week really does turn around. And, and what it seems to say Budge is saying there is the door still seems to be ajar for Nadine. Mm. Uh, if she does indeed lose that... Uh, that that cons constituency support, then that makes life a little bit difficult for mm. her in the constituency. You know, the, the the party machine which goes around helping at election time, the 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 office, those sort of things uh, aren't open to the MP. Well, that kind have, of meeting, the budge to have an office themselves and that kind of stuff as an independent, but it would make life a, a pretty lonely existence for Nadine, who's already had you know a fair share of, of controversy, and and that has made her a little bit of a pariah within the party. I think she's seen there's a bit of a thorn in the side. So uh, it would be really fascinating. To see see what happens at the end of that meeting this week. Paul, thank you very much. Paul Scoynes, uh, our political reporter, who was, was off maybe getting himself some toast there. Who knows? But an excellent job. Thank you, Paul. And no doubt he'll keep us up to date with what happens when that meeting occurs. Wow. Budge wasn't happy, was he? I can only apologise to those people who set their watches by this show. I've been all over the shop today. Sorry. Here's the news. <laughs> Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's just got eight o'clock already. 
This morning's flying by. Absolutely flying by. Jonathan Vernon Smith will be on at 9 o'clock. He'll pop in in about 10, 15 minutes. I believe he's talking more about Nadine Doris. Coming up, US elections, Nadine Doris and adoption. Lots to talk about. If you want to give us a call on any of these, uh, uh, 08459 455 555. Lots of comments on the Facebook page. I will read as many of those before 9 o'clock as possible. And we are on the hunt for people who own a square of Luton Town FC's AstroTurf. Don't, don't embarrass us. Next Wednesday, whatever happens, Justin Dealey is going to be in the Three Counties car park or somewhere similar with all of the AstroTurf we can muster and have a footballing legend kick a ball on it. Now, if it's just his square, we are in very, very serious... Well, we're not in trouble. He's in trouble. Yesterday, oh, no, all right, get up, be fine. We'll get loads of people. Seriously, we'll get loads of people phoning about this. If you've got a little bit... It's not a bad impression, is it? Oh, girl. <laughs> I don't know if he's ever said that phrase, but... If you've got... I hope he's not listening. If you've got a bit of the AstroTurf, we do need you to get in touch with us. You can either call this morning, 08459 455 555, or you can send us an email, 3cr at bbc.co.uk. Put in the subject heading Ian Lee, AstroTurf, and we'll see what we can sort out. BBC Three Counties Radio. Oh, wait, four, five, nine, four, double, five, five, double, five is the telephone number. Now, another four years in the White House. Well, t- I can't say it. We'll try again, shall we? Let's, let's have another run up at that. Another four years in the White House is guaranteed for Barack Obama after the Democrat president claimed victory in the early hours in one of the closest US elections in years. I can't be rude to people who say Mick Romney anymore, can I? While the popular vote remains too tight to call, the Electoral College has fallen to President Obama, who now has 303 of the votes there that he needs to retain power. It was the swing state of Ohio that clinched the win for Obama. He thanked supporters across the country as he spoke at his election HQ to rapturous applause. In this election, you, the American people, reminded us that while our road has been hard, while our journey has been long, we have picked ourselves up. We have fought our way back. And we know in our hearts... But for the United States of America, the best is yet to come. Well, Mark Margaretten is lecturer of political communications at the University of Bedfordshire. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Mark, you've been up all night with students, hardcore, watching the results come in. What was it like? It has been a late night. We ate a lot of chips and salsa and M&Ms and drank a lot of coffee. Now, hang on a second, hang on a second. When you say chips, do you mean chips or do you mean crisps? Tortilla crisps. OK, we've got to translate this. OK, we need to, <laughs> there, there will be, press your red buttons now, you will get subtitles. So uh, you stayed up eating a load of the, the junk food and enjoying yourselves. Uh, yeah. it, was it enjoyable watching it? Well, sure it was. Uh, of course, I'm here and I'm not in the States. Normally, I would be with my friends in the States. Mm. But seeing a bunch of students get all excited about it was it was really good for everybody. And, of course, it's a complicated process. So uh, having an Americanist in the room was very helpful. It was a good night. Was the result what you expected? Yes, I did. Um, frankly, if Romney had won, it would have meant that every poll conducted over the last six years has been wrong. And that's simply not really, that's not possible. So, yeah. uh, Romney was, was very gracious in his um, defeat speech. I suppose he, he had no choice. Uh, has anybody ever, who, who's lost, come out, you know, with all guns blazing? <laughs> no, but it would make great television. Wouldn't, wouldn't it, just? <laughs> you, imagine if you came out, you idiots, you voted the wrong guy in, it should have been me. You know, I, I always wish for a politician to be frank and honest in that way. Because you know inside, Romney is just seething. <laughs> the entire Republican Party wants blood. And, and you know, to hear someone stand up and say it would be refreshing, frankly. What it happens, would be a, a Bullworth moment. Wouldn't it? What happens to, to Romney now? Well, he gets to go play golf in the, in the islands with all his money. That's really, his political career is over. And he might go back into, um, into the finance world, but... You know, he's made his money. He's mm. going to go play golf. Is that it? Once once you've, you've failed to be elected as the president, p- politics is over for you, pretty much? Well, no, not quite. I mean, Richard Nixon uh, famously failed. Uh, John F. Kennedy beat him. He went on to run eight years later and get elected. So it's not unheard of. 
But I think in these modern times, the the vitriol and the anger that goes on in these kind of modern campaigns really ends a career at this point. And, and what's Obama going to do next? What's the, what's the first thing that he needs to do? Well, the first thing is to deal with what they call the fiscal cliff. Uh, if you recall last year, the debt ceiling, there was some contention over raising the debt ceiling, so whether or not the U.S. would default on its debt. Part of that deal was to put in place a spending package where there would be $600 billion in automatic cuts in the beginning of January. Uh, the idea was that it wouldn't affect the election and that they would come to the table in January and make a deal. So the first thing they have to deal with is that. Uh, I suspect that they're not going to really cut a deal. They may push it back, mm. but that we'll see a, the U.S. go into a short recession as a result. Mark, go to bed and have a sleep. Oh, you're, you're not kidding, man. I need it. <laughs> Fantastic. Mark Margaretten, lecturer of political communications at the University of Bedfordshire. Now, if you're listening to yesterday's show, you'd remember Anne Chappell, who had just the most amazing voice. She's from Wellin and is part of the American Club of Hertfordshire. I was very jealous when I spoke to her yesterday because she was invited to the American embassy to see the results come in. Fantastic. Anne, did you have a good night there? Well, you know, actually, I ended up not going. My you didn't go? Well, my- you know what? Believe it or not, my husband had been out of town in the Middle East, and he had just gotten back in the early morning. So we made a decision not to go. And also, I have a sister in Ohio, and I had spoken with her, and I think we were pretty certain about what the outcome was going to be. I think at the embassy, they had about 1,700 people there, wow. so they had a really good... Good, good showing at the embassy. I wish you'd called me and given me your invite. I would have loved to have gone down to that. So, so you, you, uh, at what stage did you kind of, because you were supporting Romney, weren't you? Yes. At what stage were you aware that it was kind of over for him? I, I really, I think, you know, the, the polls nowadays are pretty accurate, mm. and um, they were pretty clear the last couple of days that it was... Um, going to be re-election for Barack Obama. Um, so I'm a bit disappointed, but I'm, I'm sure the president is slightly disappointed as well, because um, certainly, you know, he got, it looks like about 10 million votes less than he did mm. the time before, and I said, that I guess that's like in Facebook when you get unfriended, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good way of putting it, yes. I guess, but the whole world knows you got unfriended. Um, so he's got some challenges ahead for him, but the, I think the great thing about the Americans is we tend to try to pull together. I think one, you know, certainly, you know, the fiscal cliff has ever, it's been mentioned before is a big issue, but mm. I think right now there needs to be some focus just on those people, um, in the New York and New Jersey area, and we need to keep those people safe and well and get them through what's going to be surely difficult times, not just for the next couple of months, but really for the next couple mm-hmm. of years. I grew up in Louisiana, so I know how devastating a um, an event like that can be. And you sounded so optimistic yesterday and so upbeat, and you do sound genuinely depressed this morning. This has really affected you, hasn't oh, it? Well, I think with, you know, it's always, you know, when your your candidate doesn't win, my football teams don't win, and I get, you know, upset, but then there's always, you know, you carry on, and, um, you know, it's a great country, there's a lot that can be done, um, it's certainly gone a little bit more liberal than I would think, having, you know, voted in in some of the uh, states to legalize marijuana, and, um uh, you know, same-sex marriages, so it, there's been a real shift to um, very liberal ideas in the U.S. And listen, lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much. Anne Chappell, part of the American Club of Hertfordshire. She's from Wellin. Um, I, love, I love that line. He, he, he had, Obama has 10 million uh, less votes than he had last time. It's like being unfriended on Facebook and everybody knows. <laughs> That's fantastic, isn't it? Speaking of Facebook, we've been talking... Uh, Facebook.com forward slash BBC 3CR. Go there and have a look. We've got some pictures of, of uh, Justin Dealey uh, handle, handling his AstroTurf. We've also asked on there, should Midbeds MP Nadine Doris be sacked... Lots of you have commented on there. Um, Carol Pearson, self-promoting. What on earth has this got to do with being a good MP and working uh, on behalf of her constituents? Dawn says, they get the time off when Parliament closes for the summer, so surely she should be working now and therefore shouldn't have taken the job. Overpaid in every way, but she's still claiming her second house allowance. Complete joke. We should ins- insist on a full review of MPs' wages and expenses and make, them cu- uh, make the cut to deal with the country's current financial problems. 
uh, Trevor Luckett. No, isn't everybody allowed some sort of holiday and time off? Who's to say what she does with her time off? I don't know how she thinks she's a celebrity, though. And let me just pick one more uh, uh, random. Should she be sacked? Gary uh, uh, Henderson says no. Why shouldn't she do what she likes in her own time? She is possibly taking it as a holiday. I can't see a problem. Is she taking it as a holiday? Be interesting to find out. I'm not sure she is. I think she could still be getting paid her MP's salary. Uh, in, in a bit, Jonathan uh, Vernon smith will be popping in and telling us about his phoning. I believe he's asking, is Nadine Doris fit to remain as an MP? There we go, I've done it. I, I, I've done it, Jonathan. You don't need to come down. I've just done the, the bit for you. You don't need to pop in this morning. Is Nadine Doris fit to remain as an MP? JVS, nine o'clock. Simple as. Without any of the innuendo and filth, you see? <laughs> Morning, it's 8.15, it's Wednesday the 7th of November. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Don't make me laugh, Jonathan, please. Barack Obama has been re-elected uh, to a second term as American... Stop it. So, oh, stop it, please, for goodness sakes. Luckily, th- these are all stories are, you know, are all quite light. In sport, Ben Ainsley has won the International Sailing Federation Sailor of the Year Award. <laughs> That's a surprise. Well done, Ben. He's won it for a fourth time. Congratulations. Ainsley, why didn't that, where did that come from? Is that a sport? Sailing? It's not a sport. Not to, de, you know, de, de, demean his um, achievement. <laughs> Ainsley won his fourth Olympic gold medal at the London Games. The weather today... Is it really a sport? The weather today for beds, hearts and bucks. Uh, dry, bright and breezy today with a top temperature of 11 degrees. Uh, coming up... Oh, I'll do that later on. <laughs> I can't do that. It's, it's tasteless. BBC Three Counties Radio. Jonathan Vernon Smith, you're looking like um, Doctor Who. <laughs> Am I? You know, I saw you flouncing down the, the corridor past the studio, coming in with your, your lovely mauve sweater <laughs> uh, and your college scarf on. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't like being cold. It makes you grumpy. I hate being cold. Well, that's winter. Yes, I don't like it. Right very simple i don't like being cold well and i'm cold in here do you have long johns mm, no oh get some long johns get some thermals on really yeah of course there's like no shame in that it's not my legs that get cold what is it it's it's round here we'll get pants pants <laughs> oh <laughs> where were you no around here around, around your, my your, chest your moves yes okay. i get uh, i get yes i get i get well. a chest in the winter lucky you <laughs> 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 then get thermal um a thermal vest well, OK. Perhaps I'll wear a thermal vest tomorrow just for you. OK, I know what secret Santa's going to be getting you oh. for Christmas. Are we doing Christmas presents this year? Well, I think we should. There, there, there are uh, talks and it's not been negotiated with my agent yet. Right. I need to... I'm going to ask for a Christmas fee. There are talks. I think we can say this. Hmm. We're going for lunch with the boss on Friday. Ah. Uh-huh. There, there are talks of us possibly doing a show over Christmas. Possibly. Possibly. Don't give away no, too much. No, nothing. I mean, it'll be rubbish, but uh, it will. we can give that away. Possibly. And right. I, I, I would suspect that... I would expect a present from you. On, on that show? Yeah, of course. Why okay. not? OK. Fine. But, like, a good one... Oh, really? Yeah, I don't want anything... I don't want, like, a Santa that farts or something. <laughs> I, don't, I want a good one. I want one I can take home and go, yeah, look what Jonathan got me, man. This is awesome. So something really nice. Okay. Like a, a car. A car? I'll get you a car. A car or something. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> something nice. This is not the price is right, you know. <laughs> Come on down! <laughs> Remember that? I used to love that. Leslie Crowther. Yeah, and the lights on the car were always... They always had the hazard warning lights on. <laughs> Didn't they just? Didn't they? they did. It was always a day <laughs> A day with flashing <laughs> lights. <laughs> Leslie Crowther was great. He, he got very ill, didn't he? Because he had a car accident. But he was great. Come on down! <laughs> <laughs> he had that rasp in his voice, didn't he? And they'd come down, they'd be like, yes! Woo! <laughs> and they would win a load of old toots. <laughs> You'd be good hosting a, a show like that. I'd like to do something You'd be like good that. at that. Do you think, uh, oh, you suggest that to my agent then? Okay, I will. You should, something like that, or um, Bullseye. Ian Lee, come on down. Oh, no, that was uh, Strike It Lucky. Strike It Lucky. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Oh, what's a hot spot not? No, exactly. <laughs> right. 
So coming up on the big phone, it's nothing too morning. serious, is it? We can go from this flippant. Well, no, I'm, go- I'm continuing with the discussion you've been having this morning because it's uh, people want to talk about it. Nadine Dorsey, she was everywhere yesterday. It, it's the big local story at the moment. From mid beds, uh, exactly. <laughs> is Nadine Dorries fit to remain an MP? There are growing problems for the Conservative MP for Mid Bedfordshire, Nadine Dorries, fo- following her decision to appear on the reality TV show "I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here." Nationally. Her party's now suspended her, withdrawing the whip. Have a cough, go on. <clears throat> Thank and you. she's in trouble with local supporters as well. Mm. Her decision has received very mixed reviews from her constituents, with many deeply unhappy with her trip to Australia. Mm. So from nine this morning, I want to hear your views. Is Nadine Dorries fit to remain an MP? Do you think this is the beginning of the end? I wonder, I just wonder whether, has she... Has she decided she doesn't want to be an MP anymore? He's freestyling now, dear listener. He's off script. I'm just wondering, because this is my my feeling on it. I think she's probably decided, I'm a bit bored of this MP malarkey now, Um, so I'm going to jack it in anyway, so I might as well go to the jungle, because it just seems such a bizarre thing to do. I mean, who else? Name me another politician in the UK who would even dream of going in the jungle... And I'm a celebrity. While they're serving, no, while they're serving, I can't think of any. And nobody would. Yeah. So why is she doing this now? Is it because she's thought, well, perhaps if I do this, I could get a TV career? Mm. And she I... will do. She will. Do. She'll, she'll get a slot on this morning. Uh, you know, reviewing the papers and, and going out and reporting. She'll get a reality show on Channel Five or ITV Two. She, she'll do fine of it. She's she's outspoken. She's quite attractive, um, and she's opinionated. She'll do. She'll do well out of it. She'll make a fortune. At home with the Dorries, that kind of thing. Like the Osbournes. That kind of thing, yes. Right. yes. Who was that? Sally Burko went off with the gypsies, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> she did, didn't she? <laughs> Paddy Doherty. Paddy Doherty. Yeah, she went She off. did, so I'm not she being offensive. Jo- no, that's, no, that's, no, that's, she that's, did that's, a show with Paddy Doherty. She. Yes, from, the, from uh, my big fat gypsy wedding. <laughs> yes, she went off and, and, live, and live with him on a... Uh, it's true. Would well, you think Nadine Dorries might, might do something similar? It depends. She's, she's in there with the, um, the crafty Cockney, Eric Bristow, one of Britain's greatest sporting... Well, I don't know anyone else who's in there. Who else is in there? Eric Bristow. Eric Bristow. Rosie Webster from Coronation Street. Rosie Webster? She was the lesbian. Right. OK. And, um... Shack Attack? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know who the other people are, though. No. I don't know. Shack Attack! Shack Attack. Nadine, Do- Nadine Dorries is having a barbecue with Shack Attack, crab a campfire. <laughs> we have to go close. <laughs> You've taken ten minutes of my I'm show. I'm really sorry. For goodness sorry. sakes. Go. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Ta-ta. Bye. Across beds, hearts and barks, this is Ian Lee. Right. On onwards. BBC Three Counties Radio. Onwards and upwards. It's National Adoption Week. Very important week. An adoption charity in Milton Keynes says siblings shouldn't be separated when being placed with new families. It comes after a government parliamentary debate in which the idea of separating brothers and sisters was discussed, if it speeds the adoption process. It was a debate that didn't sit well with St Francis's Children's Society in Milton Keynes. They say it's crucial for a child's stability to keep siblings together. Sean Calvert and his partner Lee adopted their little girl when she was 18 months old, then later agreed to take her brother as well, before he was born. Joins on the line now. Good morning, Sean. Morning, Ian. Well, uh, Sean, you adopted Elizabeth as a single child. Why did you then decide to take her brother three years later? It was always our intention when we started the adoption process to look at uh, sibling groups. We, we each of us have a younger sibling, and we wanted to sort of replicate that with our own family. Uh, but when we got matched with Elizabeth, uh, she was just such a perfect match for us that we the idea was well we'll look at adopting elizabeth we'll go with that match and then later on uh if time well what circumstances permit we'd look at adopting further another child and then it just so happened that as we were coming to the end of the adoption process with elizabeth and she was about to move in with us we had a call from social services who said birth mum was pregnant again and one of the options discussed was would we look at adopting whoever came along and we said yeah we'd be very much up for that and then then Christopher was born and uh, we started the adoption process again and then he came to live with us when he was 11 months old. Do you think it's important that she's with her brother because some people might say well hang on she didn't even know her brother so it, it, she wouldn't have missed anything not being with him. Absolutely but but one thing that's quite crucial for them is they have a shared story. We, we're, we're big supporters of open adoption. We just discuss adoption very openly with the children and they have a shared history so even though they're not not ours by biology, mm. they're ours by, by law and by love, but they have a shared story there. There is a family out there, and we've been very lucky that we've actually been able to meet with, with members of the birth family. So these aren't 
awful people. They mm. just couldn't really manage to look after themselves and some children. There was no, no malicious intent there. So they, they have a shared history, and it's something else that they have in common. When I think if, if for some siblings uh, going through the adoption process, they may have lost everything else but each other. Sean, being friends with the, the birth family, does that not, just going off on a slight tangent, does that not worry you that one day they'll go, hang on a second, they're ours, we want them back? No, not at all. Right. And, and pro- to say friends is probably uh, pushing it a little okay, far. Contact. We have, uh, yeah, we have contact. Yeah. We have letterbox contact. We've had face-to-face meetings. Um, no, that won't happen. They, they could very well. I mean, I'm, I'm fully supportive of the children's decisions later in life if they decide uh, that I want to have a full. Uh, relationship with the birth family even to the exclusion of us that's mm. something that you you would accept when you become an adopter yeah. it's uh, well, as with any child they may decide later in life they want nothing to do with you but i'd hope god i'd hope that wouldn't happen but no very happy for them whatever they choose and whatever relationship they want with their birth family i'd fully support how old are the kids now sean uh chris uh, elizabeth has just turned five and started primary school and chris is three yeah good luck with that <laughs> thank you very <laughs> I've much i've got a little boy who's about to turn <laughs> three and he is bonkers well i have to say one of the <laughs> when, when they when they asked if I'd, uh, we're willing to come on today. They offered me 7.20. <laughs> no, absolutely. Good God, no. Oh, sure, listen, best of luck. Enjoy it. It's wonderful, wonderful ages. Thank you. That's the uh, opinion of a parent. What does the council think? Sue Imbriano is the strategic director for children and young people at Bucks Council. Morning, Sue. Good morning, Ian. Y- you don't always follow the rule to uh, keep siblings together, do you? I think it's important, uh, Ian, in discussing this, to think about what rules and children. I mean, our paramount concern is that we look at each child as an individual. We're very clear that we need to find the best solution depending on the needs of each individual child. And what we try to do is to get the best match. And I think one of the dangers sometimes is that sometimes people can assume applying a set of rules on a blanket or one-size-fits-all basis is going to suit every case. Now, of course, we're absolutely supportive of anything that makes the process go as quickly as possible because we want to place our children and young people, who are often very vulnerable children and young people, with adoptive parents as soon as we possibly can. But we really do need to make sure that it's in the best interest of all concerned and we would absolutely encourage anyone who's thinking about adoption to contact us. We do need more adopters. We've currently got a number of children and young people that we're seeking to place and we need about 30 adopters, additional adopters at least at the moment. And where we can't place sibling groups, what we do is we make sure that we're supporting both those children and young people and the adoptive parents to maintain the contact because absolutely, as Sean said, what's really important to children and young people is their story and their life story and that they maintain any stability at all in their lives as they grow up. So where siblings can't be adopted together, you do encourage the, uh, the, the separate families to, to, to help the kids keep in touch? Absolutely. We try to support both, as I said, the children and young people themselves in their placements and indeed the adoptive parents to make sure we're maintaining that contact for them. Sue, thank you very much. Sue and Briano, their Strategic Director for Children and Young People at Bucks Council. It just makes me think my boy is three. Uh, it will be three in January and I had great trouble getting him to bed last night. He wears a nappy in bed, right? And he said, Daddy, I don't need a nappy in bed. I'm a big boy. I do a wee-wee in the toilet. <laughs> I was thinking, yeah, yeah, that's, that's not going to happen. As soon as he was asleep, we had to go and sneak a nappy on. That's mental, but the most fun you can have. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. I'm enjoying this today. I hope you are. 30 minutes left, then it's JVS uh, taking over. Should mid beds MP Nadine Doris be sacked? BBC Three Counties reporter Justin Dealey is out and about getting your reaction. We'll hear from him in a second. And also. One of the first people in the country to get a forced marriage protection order has been speaking about her experience. She's from Luton. We'll be hearing from her in about 20 minutes. If you want to give us a call, 08459 455 555. Now, the Mid-Beds MP, Nadine Doris, has been suspended from the Conservative Party following her decision to take part in the I'm a Celebrity reality TV show. Earlier, I spoke to Budge Wells, the deputy chair of the Mid-Beds Conservative Association. I asked Budge if Doris should be sacked because of this. Uh, no, I think that's a bit strong. Um, I think what we need to do is when she comes back, we need to have a meeting with her and discuss uh, the whole executive of the Mid-Beds Conservative Association needs to meet with her and discuss hear what she has to say first. Uh, and then discuss the matter and then come to a conclusion. But it would be wrong for me to uh, give any credence to that sort of issue. 
Well, um, our... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm a celebrity expert. Justin Dealey has been out and about in Flitwick. Good morning, Justin. Oh, I'm an expert now, am I? Yes, you are. Yes, I'm you a celebrity. Are. Yes, well, you what, are. what a claim to fame that is. You but didn't. So... Can I just say you didn't hear my impression of you earlier on, did um, you? Yes, I did. Ah. Wasn't impressed at all. Ooh. Can you do it again for me? All right, girls. Listen. We'll... No, right. <laughs> listen. You've been out and about and getting yes. people's. Opi- I'm so, so <laughs> sorry. Getting people's opinions about this. What have they been saying? Well, Justin? It's, it's the story which won't go away. I'm in Flitwick this morning. A few moments ago, I spoke to Lawrence. Lawrence, you think that Nadine Doris should be sacked? Tell us why. I think she's an attention seeker. I don't think she actually has the interest of Parliament or her constituents at heart. I think she just wants to be a celebrity, and now she's achieved it. We were talking about this yesterday. The whole of the world seemed to be talking about this yesterday. Were you embarrassed to say that you were from (laughs) Mid-Bedfordshire? I'm always embarrassed. <laughs> when I say I'm from Mid Bedfordshire, anybody who knows anything about politics says, "Oh, that's Nadine Doris, isn't yeah, it?" Yeah. And you can see their eyes rolling. So it's it's just a continuation of that, quite frankly. Only this is the biggest one ever. So I presume you didn't vote for it then. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> but many people did, though. So, so why is she getting in? If people think she's a laughing stock round here, why do people keep voting for her? Uh, that is the political system. Quite frankly, uh, they could put anybody up in some constituencies and people would vote for them. It's, it's the party label. I think even the Conservatives around here are starting to revise their view of that. Clearly you don't like it. So this Sunday... Might you be watching the programme? Voter in for the trials? Have a bit of fun watching her getting soaked in, in maggots? Depends what else is on. Depends whether there's any good footy on. <laughs> and just lastly... Uh, Maybe Spanish League. <laughs> uh, just lastly, you, you, briefly, you, your family and friends, do they also agree that this has been highly embarrassing and she should be sacked? They think she's absolutely ridiculous. She's a complete fool and I think she's going to come a cropper. I think the spiders will eat her. Wow, uh, there you go, Gosh, Ian. That's uh, a bit uh, very definitive, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. I'm clearly not happy about the situation. In saying that, yesterday, of course, I was in Amptill. It was exactly the same. I found one person all morning who said, yeah, good for Nadine. She's doing it for herself. And I think there, I think, is probably the key to what's going on here, doing it for herself, which a lot of people here, who, of course, voted her in, clearly not happy about. Now, Justin, listen, let's go off on a slight tangent here. You, are, I think, have possibly set me up to, to come a cropper. No. <laughs> In yesterday's meeting, after the show, we have a little meeting where we discuss what we might do in the next show, and there was, there was silence. There was a silent moment, and you used that to, to p- speak up and go, all right, girls, listen, yeah. right, I've got a little bit of AstroTurf, right, from the Luton... I won't do the voice. I've got a little bit of AstroTurf from Luton Town's football ground. You said, I, I bet we can find loads of people mm. that have got it. Mm. You brought it in, it's tiny, you Beautiful. paid a tenner for it. Yeah. I put it up on uh, Facebook, and uh, Reboo uh, Bridges says, oh, I could use that as a coaster for my mug of tea. Easy. Um, and uh, uh, we are hoping that next Wednesday we can get enough people together, enough of this turf together, so we can recreate the football pitch in the Three Counties car park, Heavenly. get a legend of Luton Town Football Club to come and have a little kick around on it. We have had no response on it whatsoever, okay, Justin. Okay. W- watch this magic, that this will work, OK? Now, we're talking about the AstroTurf pitch. It was used from 1985 to 1991. During that period, they won the Littlewoods Cup. They finished seventh in the old top flight. When they got rid of the pitch, the year later, they were relegated. So it's, it's quite historic. There must be people. There's got to be thousands of people out there. <laughs> thousands! <laughs> thousands! <laughs> thousands! <laughs> we haven't had any! Okay. If anybody has a piece of the Luton Town AstroTurf like me, I've looked after this for years. I touch it every single day. <laughs> it is wonderful. Please can you phone this number 08459 455 555 I can't be the only sad oh surely whatever happens next Wednesday whether it's just you or it's thousands of people yes. you will be in the uh, three counties car park and we'll be filming it with that bit oh. we have had listen I, I said we've had no feedback that's not true mm. on the Facebook page uh, I put a photograph of you holding the AstroTurf. Aidan Kane, great photo. Notice that all three CR presenters are good-looking. Well, he's got a point there, hasn't he, to be fair? Uh, Michael is upset. Has Justin not been given a BBC coat? Justin? <laughs> Um, Re- Rebu Bridges. Uh, oh, no, Mark says, that boy needs a haircut. Oh, leave it out. It's fashion. And uh, Rebu Bridges says, no, he doesn't. Justin's hair is nice, oh. exclamation mark. Lovely comments, guys, but come on, we need some of the AstroTurf. <laughs> Surely somebody somewhere has got a piece of this AstroTurf. Uh, I suspect you're going to be a very lonely man in the car park next mm-hmm. Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Ta-ta. Across beds, hearts and barks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. And just on the uh, Nadine Doris, I should say that uh, from nine o'clock, JVS will be discussing this on the big phone-in. He's asking, is Nadine Doris fit? 
to remain as an MP. Sorry, I've missed the end of the, the, the question there. 08459 four double five five double five is the phone number if you want to give us a call. It seems that most of you are kind of dead against her keeping her job. There are a few of you who have gone, well, you know what, come on, give her a break. She's only away for a few weeks. Let her get on with it. Let her do it. But it, it, most of you seem quite angry about it. And the, the reason, I guess, that we're banging on about it so much, it, it is important. I think, genuinely, on a serious note, I think it is important uh, when an MP takes uh, a break to pursue what can only be cast as selfish measures, really. It, 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 she's, she's doing it for herself. She's going to get paid 40 grand. She'll make a load more off the back of it if, if people like her. Um, she's not doing it to get politics across. You can't. On a show like that, you can't. If you, if you g- go in genuinely thinking that's what you're going to do, what you're going to achieve, you're being naive. It's a freak show. It's a great freak show. I love it. Oh, I love it. Love watching it. But it's a freak show, isn't it? 08459 four double five five double five. It was all... I was surprised it was all over the news yesterday. Everywhere were doing it. All the BBC stations. Uh, I was in London. A lot of the local stations in London, LBC and other ones, were doing it. It was on um, news... The, the ITV News last night. Everywhere. It's a huge thing. Susie's in Milton Keynes. Good morning, Susie. Hello, Ian. All right. I'm all right, thank you. What do you reckon about Nadine? Well, basically, she's going from one jungle to another, isn't she? Ooh, a little bit. I see what you've done there. A little bit of politics. Do you think it's? Yeah. Ooh, do oh, you... I think it will do a, a lot of good um, to a, as you say, kangaroo scrotum. It will probably make her very popular when she comes out. Not with the kangaroos, it won't, Susie. Well, no, no, poor kangaroos. But it will do her a bit of good. She probably likes a bit of rough. Yes, in terms of roughage in her diet. Yes, of course, yeah. that's, that's what you mean. You uh, know. Do, but does, do you think that it's appropriate, Susie, for a, a, an MP to take three or four weeks off just to go and get 40 grand and be on telly? I think she's doing the right thing. Good girl. Really? Yeah. What, how, what, how is it the right thing? Is she not letting down the, the, the constituents of mid-beds? Oh, look, come on. She hasn't done an awful lot, has she? She's very outspoken, Susie. Yeah, well... Better be, but she really isn't doing much of a job outside, so she might as well go in the jungle. Oh, you a fan of the jungle, Susie? I love it. It's a good show, isn't it? It's I one of those can't... things that you shouldn't really watch because it's dirty, but it's it's good. Yeah, but it's just so watchable. You just can't wait to see the next thing. Every year, I'm like, I'm not watching this. Same with Big Brother. I'm not watching this, and then I'm I'm, yeah. I'm sucked in. And then you're hooked. Yeah. You've got to watch it, haven't you? Susie, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Darren's in Leegrave. Good morning, Darren. Hiya. I believe you've called in to um, stick two fingers up at me and pat uh, Justin Dealey on the back. Yeah. D- y- you've heard his plea for someone with some of the loot and pitch. Can you help? Yeah, I've got a bit. There's ten centimetres by ten centimetres. I'm, 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 I'm t- is yours there now? Yeah. Are, y- are you touching it? Yeah. I'm touching Dealey's. I'm touching Dealey's pitch. <laughs> I'm, I've, I've got Justin Dealey's AstroTurf in my hand and I feel there's a psychic connection between us, Darren. <laughs> what? How if much? If it you... comes to the worst, we could like strap them down to the football players' boots on each side. So. He's a genius. This man is a genius. <laughs> this is. We need someone like this working on our team. Uh, th- how much did you pay for it, Darren? Uh, I can't remember. I've had it for a long time. Why did you buy it? Bit of. It was such a great Luton Town team. Yeah. It was it. If you if you have put some of the players that we sold together as within like a five year period we could have possibly won the top flight league but it was an old division one back that, that, in them days that's quite a, va- a vague <laughs> if some of the players over five years put them together we'd have had a good team that's a little well, bit vague Darren we loaded we sold a couple of players and then we bought some more players right. and we had young players coming through and if we'd have had had a little bit more money perhaps signed Frank McAvenny back in 1985 he was punched by West Ham. You've lost for, me now. You're actually speaking yeah. fluent football here. I'm completely out of my yeah. depth. Darren, yeah, next Wednesday, can you come yeah. to the BBC Three Counties car park? I'll try to. Oh, you don't sound that bothered. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I can pop the bit in when I'm in town. <laughs> that, that'll be good enough for us, Darren. Thank you very much. OK, so we've got two bits of AstroTurf from Luton. It, it might not be so embarrassing for Dean. It, good point he makes there, Darren. If we get a football player in, and I'm, 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 I'm hoping we get a real big star from Luton Town, I've got no idea what I'm talking about, uh, we can strap the AstroTurf to their boots, and they'll be walking around wherever they go. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Come on, if you've got some of this, get in touch. 08459 455 555, or email us. If you, if you want to get in contact with the show, 
um, and, you know, we're not on air, you can always send us an email, 3cr at bbc.co.uk. Just put in the subject heading Ian Lee, and it will get to us eventually. I don't know who it goes to, but they, they do arrive, apparently. Uh, Andy in Luton has texted in, Ian, a lot of Luton fans would have segments of the artificial pitch, but not enough to put it together to have a kickabout on. Andy, we are... Uh, Dealey has promised this is. He claims that thousands of people will have it. Thousands! For goodness sakes. Uh, last 15 minutes of the show. If you want to give us a call about um, the AstroTurf or Nadine Doris or any of the things we've been talking about this morning, now is probably the time to do it. There's a couple of lines free. One of the first people in the country to get a forced marriage protection order has been speaking about her experience. Sonia, who's now 20 and from Luton, obtained the order after her parents tried to force her to go to Pakistan to get married when she was 16. They ended up having their passports confiscated. Sonia has been talking to our reporter, Nish Nathwani. It was one day where me and my, f- my good friend, we bunked a day off and she decided to go MK. And so we went with her. And <clears throat> this girl, she was having some trouble with black girls and she wanted to come back and help her fight. But we couldn't get back in time because of the traffic. So <clears throat> she told the head of year. So they phoned the police, they phoned our parents. My dad came to school looking for me. So he saw us in the car, he started chasing us. And I got into my uncle's car, he come, picks up from high school. So we at home, my dad kind of slapped me across the face and said, OK, I'm going to book your ticket, we're going to Pakistan tomorrow. So I was like, OK. The next day he came and goes, don't worry, I'm, we're not taking you back home to get married, we're taking you for a holiday. And I was like, OK, I get to see my family. And when I got there a few weeks later, my dad was like, OK, there's four boys you've got to choose to get married from. And there was one boy where he really wanted me to get married because they were promised or something. He said, his mum's going to die, she's got cancer, his dad's dead. And I was, just, I was scared. But my dad was at home half the time and that boy used to come and just give, like, you know, rice or something. And then he raped me, but I didn't tell anyone because I knew no one's going to believe me. I came back to the UK. Um, my, grand- my dad went back before me and I came back with my grandma. I came back here. I told my dad, my dad goes, no, you'll get married whether you like it or not. I don't believe you. So my friends were like, oh, just phone the police or f- force marriage or something. So I phoned the police and they came. But the police were believing my dad because he was like, oh, I'm taking her to cook and clean. And the police clocked on like, oh, no, this is not this is not happening. So I didn't want to stay there. So then next lay I've got put into care. But I was going to get sent to London. But I didn't want to go to London because I didn't know anyone and I was going to be like in a foster home or a hostel and I didn't want to go. How does this make you feel? Have you, have you done, have you tried to... Uh harm yourself in any way or? yeah i have numerous times and i've gone to lucky and i've told her look i've done this because i phoned my mum and she just doesn't want to know me sometimes she said you should die the day you were born and you put shame on the family and you've left me behind and i'm taking your side and you don't care and i said well mum you didn't believe me when i left home so so when you was in court was your family there opposite you yeah i so said my uncle my brother my, my mum dad auntie and uncle were there and, and uh, you was there basically getting your documents and, and getting yeah, them... Yeah, they didn't want their passports to be taken off them because they were... Mer- they were kid about the passports, and obviously not me. They were like, we can't go to Pakistan in an emergency. It's your fault. We want our passports back. So a couple of weeks say, well, I just told the court to give their passports back because they were just bugging me for them. So they waited to go to Pakistan in case it was an emergency. So the court took their passports as well? Yeah, they took them everything, that the green card that you have to yeah. go to Pakistan and everything. Wow. What a story. Well, on the line is Dr. Nazia Khanum from Luton, who's done extensive research into forced marriage. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. How typical is Sonia's case? Very typical. Quite a lot of cases, actually, I have seen uh, which are very similar, particularly um, taking girls to Pakistan on false pittance, as it were. Uh, You know, they, they are taken there... Uh, And then suddenly this forced marriage takes place and they have no choice, basically. But uh, rape, which she mentioned, is also a very, very typical example of how they uh, become powerless. Because when somebody is raped, you can imagine how vulnerable and powerless they feel. And that is also used as a kind of blackmailing point on them. Uh, it's not just in Pakistan. I mean, it happens in other countries as well, as you know. And um, Pakistan is an example here because quite a lot of people are from that community mm. um, and from traditional background. So uh, I don't want to finger point to any particular no. community here. How widespread is the problem in Luton today? 
It is widespread, otherwise there won't be any specialist court in Luton. As you know that there are only uh, sort of about 14 or 15 specialist courts to take on FMPOs, which is forced marriage protection orders, as it were. And uh, Luton has got one. It shows that only where the numbers um, merit the establishment of a court like this, um, only there the courts are established and Luton has got one. That's evidence enough. Doctor, what's the process of getting a forced marriage protection order? Well, actually, the local authorities are given um, power to uh, issue forced marriage protection order. The police, if, if anybody goes to the police, uh, immediately the police will um, actually uh, go on to the process without losing time because risk is very important what kind of risk is attached to any case if it is high risk then they will immediately go and um, join up with the um, authority local authority and then the protection order within 48 hours sometimes even less than 48 hours you can get a protection order from the court so the girl can be or the boy can be taken away because it can happen to boys i was going to say can it happen to boys as well you you'd imagine it's it's primarily girls and women it it happens to girls it's the gendered violence Mm. basically but on the other hand don't forget about 15 percent cases are coming out uh, from the boys Uh, so they should not be left uh, without any support Um, how easy is it to prove someone is being forced to marry against their will it is quite easy because at this point of time it's the uh, victims um, uh, who, whose side will be immediately taken up. Mm. Um, but in the future it will be a criminal offence, as probably you know. Mm. Uh, within a few months probably it will be legislated. And when it becomes a criminal offence it will be difficult to prove because uh, criminalisation of any offence means that all kinds of evidence will have to be in front of uh, the people who will take steps. I imagine um, as well, there must, the, 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 there must be, because it's family members and there can often be violence involved, I assume, that there must be a culture of fear. And so people who are victims yeah. must be afraid to speak out. There must be so many of these cases where the, the, the victims don't speak out. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's like rape cases. It's like uh, domestic abuse cases where only the most desperate ones will ever contact the agencies for support and help. Doctor, and it's uh, the tip of the iceberg, as we always say. Mm, of course, Doctor, thank you. Fascinating, Doctor Nadia Kanum from Luton, um, talking about forced marriage there. Across beds, hearts, and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Nadine Doris. Um, loads of your comments on Facebook. Here are some of them. Javane says she has a holiday in August, like all the other MPs. How could she leave her job for a month and get paid by the TV show and still come back to her job? Wrong. Uh, a couple of people, you know, lots of people saying, if I left my job for three weeks, a month, well, I wouldn't get paid. And when I came back, there's a strong chance I wouldn't get I have a job there. Corey, if she's doing it on her time, then that's fine. But she, if she's doing it on work time, then yes, she should be sacked. Rose is in Luton. Good morning, Rose. Good morning, Ian. How are you today? You're right. Yes, I'm fine. What do you reckon about Nadine going into the jungle? Well, I, I think she wants to get the sack. Really? Yeah, I do. Because I just don't see why somebody would do that and put their job at risk if they didn't want to leave. It does, as, as Jonathan was saying earlier, it does just seem like such a random decision to make that it, it that there might be an ulterior motive to it. Well, I, I think so. I mean, she's going to get paid quite a lot of money to go in there. Yeah. And um, what she gets to keep me going, I think, for... There is talk, of course, of the mid-beds constituency kind of being squeezed out of existence, and so if that goes, she is out of a job, isn't she? Well, maybe she's thinking ahead then, you know, in which case she's quite clever. I think it's quite funny, actually, and I think she is celebrity material. I'll be definitely be watching to see how she gets on. Are you a fan of the show anyway? Am I a fan of what, sorry? Are you a fan of the, the, the show? Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of those guilty pleasures, isn't it? It's, te- it's terrible, awful, exploitative, but it's good fun. <laughs> well, you know, these people go voluntarily, don't they? So... Oh, they go, they go there with a big fat check in their back pockets. Oh, boy, they get well looked after. Chris is in Bedford. Morning, Chris. Morning, Ian. What do you make about this? I think, um, I think she's doing the right thing. I think she's going to reach a lot of people. She, I've met her three times personally. She's very down to earth. She's very in touch. She knows her power. You couldn't buy the publicity she's going to get 
from being on this programme. But is but what publicity is she going to get? Is she going to get publicity for her policies and for, for politics, or is she going to get publicity for her and set her, herself up for a nice little TV career? I think it's down to the editors and the producers of um, the programme, what they're going to let go out. That's, that'll be the crux of Well, they're that. not, they're not going to let her sit there and do a party political broadcast for an hour every night, are they? Absolutely not, but I think she's, she's very articulate. She'll get in discussions. I'll have a bet with you. I bet the public put her right through it because of her status and her position. I, well, I, well, now listen, no one gets right through, through to the end because they like them. Very few people. They do it because they want to see them look like a plum. Absolutely. And I think I'll have a bet with you. I bet that the last two in it are Brian Connolly and Nadine Doris. They'll be the two most watchful people on that programme. And um, uh, I just think it's... I've, I just think Cameron knows about it. I think he's sanctioned it because he thinks, you know what? I think this would be good. And the people in mid He's not sanctioned it. She's been booted out of the party. <laughs> but publicity stunt. You can't, you can't, all publicity is good publicity. You can't get bad publicity. Chris, are you saying that, that, that her being booted out of the party is a publicity stunt and really, secretly, David Cameron is sitting at home um, rubbing his hands with glee going, yes, this is great for us? Well, let me ask you a question. Go on. Okay, I'm going to ask you three questions. Well, ask me one because we've only got 20 okay. seconds. Who, who's the education secretary? Um, go, go, go. Who's the health minister? That man. Who's who's the Chancellor Exchequer? Jeremy Hunt and um the the the, uh, the, 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 the what's his name? The, the, yes, him. Osborne. Well done. Three people in the cabinet. Who's the Dean Doris? She's a backbencher. Everybody knows about her. Yeah. Publicity pays. There we go. Thank Chris. Thank you very much indeed. And I just uh, of course I knew the answer to those questions. My producer did not need to come on my headphones and tell me that at all. I knew them. I knew them. It's hearts Unbelievable. And I knew. I knew those names. I didn't need my producer to whisper in my ear. Scott on Twitter has said, You and JVS could be the next Richard and Judy. One of you needs to get more and more dashing, the other has to sag and droop and go jowly. Who's going to be who? Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Well, I've already got the shakes. Thank you, Ian. (laughs) 